actually trapped in quarantine. Okay, uh, Mr. Mayor, we are live. All right, okay, thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to the August 4, 2020 Council regular video meeting. I'm Mayor Benson Wong. Uh, tonight's virtual is being brought to you using video conferencing technology provided by Zoom. We're also broadcasting live on MITV, Channel 21, and on the city's YouTube City Manager Jesse Vaughn and some staff members will be participating in tonight's meeting while in the city council chambers and maintaining the recommended social distance. City Attorney Bill Park and some other staff members will be participating in tonight's meeting remotely. I'm hearing some background. I don't know if it's causing that. But, um, public audience members are listening to the meeting by telephone or using the Zoom teleconferencing application. Welcome to everybody who is attending tonight's uh, meeting. Council members, uh, please uh, have your microphones turned on whenever City Clerk Deb Estrada conducts a roll call uh, during the meeting. The City Clerk will be uh, conducting roll calls and also capturing our votes. Um, City Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Benson. Here. Deputy Mayor Wendy Weicker. Here. Here. Council Member Sandro. Here. Council Member Jake Jacobson. Here. Council Member Silicon. Here. Council Member Kirk. Here. Council Member Here. Here. Thank you. Uh, Deb, I'm hearing a little background yeah, echo. I, so we, I'm hearing it as well, sir. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Um, someone may have both a phone and a computer turned on or their audio. I'd ask that anybody who isn't participating at the meeting at the moment, please turn off your audio. Okay. Um, all right. Next, we have a Pledge of Allegiance uh, Council to ensure that only the U.S. flag is visible. Please consider turning off your video camera or stepping out of view of your camera. Please join Councilmember Jacobson in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. <clears throat> One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Jacobson. We now move to the first item of business, which is to approve the agenda. Uh, before entertaining the motion, I want to state that the Governor Inslee's Proclamation Number 20-28.8 regarding the Open Public Meetings Act extends the statutory waivers and suspensions through September 1, 2020 now. Council, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay, I'm not sure who moved it. Was it Council Member Adderall? Um, yes. And then seconded by Council Member Jacobson. Uh, City Clerk, please conduct a roll call vote. Member Anderl? Aye. <coughs> Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Council Member Neese? Aye. Council Member Aye. Council Member Rosenbaum? Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. And Mayor Wong? Aye. Motion passes and the agenda is approved. For this meeting, we continue to utilize the Zoom platform. If a council member has a question, a council member will be asked to raise his or her hand uh, using the feature that's the Zoom platform. I will do my best to recognize the council member uh, in the order that uh, they raise their hands. After being recognized, he or she will then be asked, uh, be able to ask his or her question. Everyone would be asked to limit himself or herself to one question and to one clarifying question if necessary uh, to give each council member an opportunity to ask his or her question before a council member is given another opportunity to ask a question. Uh, next up on the agenda, we have the city manager's report. Uh, welcome city manager, Jesse Bond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, give me a moment here.
All right. Um, good evening. It is August 4th and uh, happy to uh, provide some updates for you. Got a little camera adjusting to do. There we go. All right, first of all, uh, a few city council updates and uh, Mayor Wong just covered one of them. Uh, first of all, the Open Public Meeting Act restrictions are extended to September 1st. And again, city council, this is um, essentially um, preventing um, in-person attendance at public meetings uh, until September 1st. So we will continue on in a virtual environment. And as I've already noted, we are prepared to continue in a virtual environment for all of our public meetings, uh, likely through the end of 2020 and uh, what looks like possibly into 2021 as well. A uh, couple updates, Council. First of all, we will be moving to allow video public appearances beginning at our September 1st meeting. Uh, thank you to the community members that have suggested that and uh, Council for supporting that option. Uh, we've been doing just audio only. And a couple people have reached out and said, hey, I don't want to be on video. And that's okay too. We'll have both options available. So we're working on our implementation strategies and we'll um, roll out more information to the community on how they can engage um, uh, by video beginning in September. Um, also, as a reminder, we have a Let's Talk page where we invite written, po uh, written public comments uh, prior to our council meeting. Uh, we were having a little bit of a challenge uh, turning around those comments to you, City Council, with enough time for you to review them prior to the meeting. Uh, so we have adjusted this, um, the cutoff time. If anyone would like to provide written comments via the Let's Talk page, please have them in by 3 o'clock p.m., the day of the council meeting. Um, and then we will council get those to you. Uh, as a reminder, we do not have a meeting on August 18th. So after tonight, our next meeting is September 1st. Also, I uh, wanted to announce that we have a number of openings on our boards and commissions. Uh, we have one seat on the Arts Council, a seat on the Design Commission, and a seat on the Utility Board. Uh, so our City Clerk, Deb Estrada, is doing a recruitment right now. Uh, if you are interested in any of these positions, please submit your application by August 21st. I know uh, we just did a round of recruitments and we've had some changes. So um, if you recently submitted an application were not selected, we encourage you to consider reapplying. Uh, some COVID-19 updates for the community. Uh, we now have 142 confirmed cases. Uh, and we have had um, an, another death reported. So five deaths from um, the Mercer Island community. Um, as a reminder to everybody, if you have symptoms, if you're exposed, uh, if you may be exposed and you're not sure, uh, please consider getting tested as soon as you can. Uh, if if you need assistance with locating a testing center, you're not sure where to go or who to call, uh, please feel, to reach, feel free to reach out to the city at our call center, and I have the number there, 206-275-7626, and we would be happy to assist you and um, help you find a testing location. A mask giveaway. Our um, emergency management volunteers remain very, very busy. Uh, we have another mask giveaway planned Friday, August 7th, um, 7 to 10 a.m. at Mercerdale Park. I'm also told we may be adding some locations this week, still to be determined, uh, but for sure we'll be out at Mercerdale Park this Friday. Uh, we continue to promote uh, these opportunities across our social media sites. Um, and as a reminder, if you need a mask and you can't make it to one of our events, uh, if you come to City Hall in our police lobby, we have um, a little tree, <laughs> if you will, with masks um, available there. And that is all thanks to our wonderful emergency management volunteers. Uh, city service updates, uh, a handful of things for you. Uh, whoopsie. Uh, the Mercer Island Community Center. Uh, it remains closed until further notice. Uh, the Community and Event Center falls technically under phase three of the governor's safe start order. We're still in phase two. Uh, so city council, I wanna let you know that um, all of our rentals and programs are canceled through the end of September. That should say September 30th. I don't think there is a September 31st. Um, rentals programs are unlikely. Uh, really, I'm, I'm, I'm not very optimistic that we'll be operating the community center in 2020, uh, but we haven't made that decision yet. So 
uh, we'll see how uh, uh, the pandemic goes and uh, the safe start restrictions provided by the governor will will continue to navigate that so we have communicated with the groups that had fall rental reservations with us and we're trying to offer as much flexibility as we can um, including allowing them to cancel with a full refund that has been our consistent practice um, throughout the pandemic uh, inviting them to book a later date and uh, we're out into 2021 at this point but honoring the 2020 rates um, and also making sure we preserve some flexibility for these renters um, to reserve their booking date until we know for sure uh, that the facility won't be able to open. Most of the uh, facility rentals on the books right now are weddings. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, it's a very tough decision to cancel a wedding. So again, we're supporting our rental groups um, with advanced communication and doing whatever we can uh, to help them. A programming council, our recreation, uh, programs were already stood down, so we don't have any programming on the books right now. Okay, uh, on another parks and recreation note, I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware on Thursday from five to five o'clock to nine uh, via Zoom, uh, we have a design charrette for the Luther Burbank docks. Um, a number of stakeholder groups were invited to participate in this interactive uh, and virtual meeting for the Luther Burbank Park docks. Um, and the public is welcome to join uh, as well. So this workshop is really starting to take a look at design options to replace and reconfigure um, the docks at Luther Burbank, really with an emphasis on improving access for smaller crafts, um, smaller power boats, sailboats, um, and paddle craft. If you've been to those docks, by the way, they're 46 years old. Uh, they sit pretty high out of the water, which uh, makes them um, tough to access uh, by the smaller watercraft. So uh, we're starting this process. Uh, we did receive a grant um, from the Recreation Conservation Office uh, through Washington State for this work. And uh, we are on a, a schedule that's tied to that grant, which is why this meeting is going forward. Uh, we'll take all the input on August 6th and we'll put together some concepts that will ben then, then be available uh, via Let's Talk uh, for input from the public end of August and into September. So I'll keep you posted as this project moves forward. Uh, thrift Shop is doing um, a soft opening or a partial reopening on Sunday, August 16th. Uh, we're opening for just a few Sundays this summer to clear our inventory. Our hours are 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we're partnering. The, the timing is in coordination with the farmer's market, so we hope uh, that we can support the farmer's market by bringing in uh, traffic and also um, uh, the farmer's market uh, shoppers will come to our thrift shop. Uh, we do want to say thank you, everyone, for your patience. We've had some stops and starts the last few weeks as we've... Um, really tried to work through what it means to temporarily reopen and clear our inventory. Um, certainly that's our goal, but obviously generating some additional resources uh, for the Youth and Family Services Department is also a top priority. Um, speaking of the thrift shop, if you stop in on the 16th, I wanna share a little bit about what to expect. Um, you do have to wear a mask uh, if you're over the age of two. Uh, we have to limit the number of people in the store, which if you've been in the thrift shop, you know it's a very narrow space, so um, there will not be very many people in the store at one time. Uh, we ask shoppers to limit their time to 30 minutes. If you bring your children, we need them to stay with you while you're shopping. Uh, we do not have the dressing rooms. They will not be open. Um, I'm not up to speed on our return policy. Uh, we are asking for uh, credit cards only, no cash. And at this time, we're not accepting donations. Um, so again, our goal is to clear out um, the inventory that we've been holding for, for quite some time. Uh, so if you're interested, we'll be pushing out more information in the next week um, on the thrift shop opening. Also, uh, get, getting ready to come back online is our municipal court. Uh, we will resume court hearings later this month. Our court has been closed since March, um, as have um, many of our services. So our reopening date is August 24th. Uh, you can see the photos in the slide there. Um, for this to work, we've had to incorporate the City Hall lobby. 
there's a whole um, circulation plan as to how people enter the building. Uh, they stay distance, they go into the courtroom and then they exit out through an exterior door. Uh, the photo on the right there is the inside of our courtroom. You can see that we have sneeze guards in place. Um, and of course there's additional cleaning requirements as groups transition in and out of the courtroom that um, we've had to incorporate into our process. So we're getting close. We have most of the uh, logistics ironed out and we're getting ready for that date. Council, I need to let you know the court will be operating um, more days a week to try to catch up on the backlog. I haven't seen the final schedule, um, but between the Mercer Island cases and the Newcastle cases, uh, you can expect at least three to four days of court operations. Okay, uh, this slide has a lot of text, so I'll quickly um, share about our backflow testing. Just as a reminder by state law, if you have a plumbing connection that could potentially allow contaminated water into our city's water system, um, it has to be protected by a backflow device. And those devices have to be tested annually. Uh, we talked about this early in the pandemic. Uh, the results are due by June 30th each year. Uh, we have allowed some flexibility. Uh, we know that there's been some challenges in getting these tests. So as of July 31st, uh, we have 948 of the backflow assemblies at 577 locations that have not yet been tested. So that's a lot. Um, we're at about an 82% compliance rate and compared to this time last year, we're behind by about 150 tests. So this is my ask. Um, if you have a backflow assembly that has not been tested yet, um, please get that test done. It's, it's really important for the safety of our water system. Uh, to have these backflow assembly tests done. Now, I know some of you have backflow assemblies that are in your house, and I'm told of the 948 assemblies that still need to be tested, um, about half of them are outside, so that must mean half of them are either in a home or you know, inside another physical location. So, if we need to do some troubleshooting, I just wanna remind you that we're here to help. Um, reach out to our call center. We'd be happy to talk with you um, about how to safely do the backflow assembly testing in your home and make sure you have access to companies that do this work. Again, our call center number is there, uh, 275-7626. Uh, business survey went out. Uh, I believe it went out last week, actually. So if you are a Mercer Island business, we would like to hear from you. Uh, the city, in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce, is conducting uh, an online survey. Uh, this is tied, um, partially funded by the Port of Seattle grant that we just received. Uh, we wanna learn more about your business and how you've been impacted by COVID-19. Um, and frankly, we're also starting to turn our attention now to the winter months and how to support businesses when you may not have the flexibility to be operating outside in the rain as uh, many of our uh, restaurants are doing now. Um, so please take a moment to take the survey. The link is there and city council for you, we will be um, presenting the results of the survey at your council meeting on September 1st. Uh, we also in the, the business category, uh, Sarah Bluvis, who's been serving in our emergency operations center as our small business coordinator, uh, launched a newsletter this week um, to support our businesses. So it, um, features all of the updates we have on COVID-19 operations. Uh, and lately there's been quite a few um, regulation changes coming from the governor's office. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to, you know, synthesize that information and get it uh, back out to our business community. Uh, Sarah's also gathering other information that might be um, useful to our businesses, webinars, toolkits, and other resources. Uh, and then certainly any, any other creative ways that we can work together to support and strengthen our business community during this time. Sarah's contact information is there. Um, please reach out to her if you'd like to be added to her um, e-newsletter list and her phone number is there as well. All right, uh, final slides here, parks update and a call to action. Uh, City Council, as you know, I made the difficult decision last week to close uh, Groveland Beach Park. Uh, this was after three weeks of trying everything we could to manage the crowds. Um, 
we had signage up, we had social media uh, information pushed out. Um, we had friendly signs, we had not so friendly signs, and we had staff um, at the park every day over a two week period. That was our EOC team members, our park maintenance members, and even our police. And the crowding, uh, the traffic, the overflowing garbage, uh, we just, we could not get a handle on it. And this photo was taken, um, I believe this was taken a couple weeks ago. Um, the other issue I just want to acknowledge is, uh, particularly I believe on the day this photo was taken, our survey of park attendees um, indicated that many were from off island. Um, so Groveland had become, uh, like it has in past summers, a hot spot. Um, it was really impacting the neighborhood and we, we were not able to get to a place of um, six foot safe distancing. So we did make the decision to close the park. Um, it's closed until further notice. We are continuing to evaluate um, when we might reopen it. it. It's not our intent to keep it closed you know, forever, but um, probably through the weekend at this point. Uh, I have no desire to close parks or to close any additional parks. And so I'm hoping that as a community, we can work together uh, to, to have safe places for all of us to go. I think many of you know I have small children, so I'm enjoying having the option um, to get out into the parks. And I know it's a, it's a top priority for our community. Um, so I just ask that if we visit our parks, we're all focusing on distancing. Uh, Luther Burbank has been busy, but you know, it's big enough that people have room um, to spread out a little bit. Uh, Clark, Pete, Clark Beach uh, Park, it's been pretty crowded. Uh, several citizens have reached out with concerns. We're monitoring. Um, so again, I will just remind you if you're visiting Clark Beach, please be uh, respectful of the need to keep a social distance. Okay, um, this is my, uh, my call to action for the community these last few slides. Um, we really need your help, Mercer Island community. Uh, we are dealing with significant amounts of trash that are really, really straining our parks maintenance staff. These pictures were all taken in the last three to five days um, in our parks. Uh, last Wednesday, it took our parks maintenance staff 16 hours clean to clean up garbage in Luther Burbank Park alone. 16 hours of garbage removal on one day in a park is just, it's not acceptable. Uh, we have never had uh, this type of problem before. Uh, we also had to call in two staff this weekend to work overtime just to keep up with the garbage in the parks. Um, and that overtime uh, is, is costing us as well. We spent, uh, we are gathering data on this. I think it's important to understand the data. 120 hours this week, um, excuse me, this last week, um, emptying garbage cans and cleaning up litter. And I had someone reach out to me today to say, hey, can you put some signs on the cans that say pack it in and pack it out? So that arrow is pointing to the sign that says pack it in, pack it out that was ripped off the garbage can. Um, we, we have removed cans in some places, uh, but we don't think that's the perfect solution either. Um, you know, at Luther Burbank, for example, it's a high volume park. Uh, we just need help. You know, when the garbage cans are overflowing, leaving your cans by the side, uh, get, leaving your waste by the side of the can is just inviting the crows and other critters to come and spread it all over the park. Um, so I just will remind everybody, and this is something that we were dealing with this week. We had our restrooms vandalized. Um, so again, this is taking time from parks maintenance staff, <laughs> taking time away from doing the other things that we need them to do in our parks. Uh, just a reminder, we are down more than 50% of our staff resources um, from this time last year. And a significant portion of our time is going to cleaning up trash and, and waste. So. Um, my ask is I've had so many citizens reach out and say, Jesse, how, we, how can we help? So this is my call to action. Uh, first of all, please pack out your garbage. You know, commit when you go to a park to bringing home your garbage for disposal. And we know a lot of families are dining out in the parks. Uh, the restaurant waste is big and bulky and just one or two families fill up a can. Um, consider, uh, if you'd like to get some volunteer time, get your kids out there and help, uh, take a garbage bag with you when you go on a walk or you're out in a park and help pick up the trash that's accumulating in our park system. You know, I really believe Mercer Island community that if we all pitched in on this, um, 
we could get our maintenance staff resources back focusing on the things that they need to be focusing on, you know, weeding, maintenance, getting our irrigation systems repaired and up and running, et cetera. So I will leave you with that. Again, Mercer Island community, we need your help um, with the garbage in the parks and you just saw the images I shared. So council, that is all I have. Thank you for allowing me to share this report. Jesse, thank you for uh, your report and um, good reminders and the uh, community members uh, everywhere will take you up on your uh, suggestions as far as bringing extra garbage bags and helping them pick up uh, garbage. Uh, tonight's agenda will not include in-person public appearances, again, in accordance with Proclamation 20-28.8 and the governor's extended stay home order. However, individuals wishing to speak live during the appearances portion of our meeting may do so by telephone or using the Zoom a teleconferencing application. Provided, however, they've registered their desire to speak with the city clerk's office uh, again by 4 p.m. today. Our city clerk will call you by name or telephone number when it's your turn to speak. Uh, this is uh, the opportunity for anyone to speak to the city council on any item. All remarks will be addressed to the council as a whole and not to any individual council member or any uh, individual staff member. If any person makes uh, personal impertinent or slanderous remarks or who becomes boisterous, threatening, or personally abusive while addressing the council, I may request that the person leave the meeting. When it is your turn to address the council, be sure to speak audibly and state your name for the record. Uh, your comments will be limited to three minutes uh, unlike past meetings, um, instead of the city clerk, I will be providing you with a 30 second and a 15 second warning when your time is about to expire. Uh, city clerk, is there anyone who has signed up for appearances and who wishes to address the council? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have four individuals signed up for tonight. The first person on our list is Carrie Warnick Newman. Hi, I'm Carrie Warnick. I'd like to start off by thanking city council members for their June 10th proclamation of, quote, committing to meaningful progress in combating racism and proclaiming a renewed commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in Mercer Island, unquote. The council website that, summar that summarizes the proclamation concludes with, quote, we will continue to explore additional ways to make Mercer Island a more diverse and inclusive environment in which everyone feels welcome and respected, unquote. Before the momentum of this proclamation dwindles, I'm here today to, in your words, quote, continue to explore ways to make Mercer Island a more diverse and inclusive environment, unquote. More specifically, I'm advocating for the next step to implement a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee under the auspice of the Mercer Island City Government. We have several wonderful boards, commissions, and committees. It's time to add a committee to oversee how race, religion, culture, et cetera, are taken into consideration in areas such as city planning, education, entertainment, and emotional and physical safety. The makeup of the committee should strive to have diversity in race, ethnicity, physical ability, socioeconomic status, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, et cetera. It would be helpful to have a resident with a professional background in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Once the committee is formed, members can decide on specific, a specific mission statement and objectives. Such objectives could include reaching out to residents for input about ways to improve inclusion on Mercer Island, working with various sectors of our community to aid in combating racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, and other isms, and strive to have equity and inclusion on our island, having events to celebrate diversity. These could be standalone events or within existing events, implementing trainings to city employees and community members, either directly by committee members or, by committee members or hiring professionals, providing advice or recommendations to city and community leaders, just to name a few. I'm open to ideas and happy to help get the ball rolling. I don't, I don't necessarily need to sit on the committee. Thank you for your consideration in implementing a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee on Mercer Island. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, the second person on our list is Ms. Addie Smith. Addie Smith, are you available? Yes. 
Ms. Addie Smith. Mr. Mayor, I don't see Ms. Smith's phone number or name on our list of attendees at the moment. Uh, would you like to move on and maybe come back to her? Yeah, so let's go ahead and move on. If uh, Ms. Smith joins us, then she can we'll add her at the very end then. Okay. The next person on our list is Ms. Meg Lippert. Can you hear me? We can, Meg. Thank you. Meg Lippert, Mercer Island. Meg, can you speak up a little bit louder? Lippert, Mercer Island. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. My comments this evening focus on the historical importance of the Mercer Island Recycling Center to the Mercer Island community and on the protection of this legacy going forward. As you may recall, my appearance last week ended with my saying that I had been given the original architectural drawings for the Recycling Center by Jim Adkins, the architect. Just a few minutes after I finished speaking, Gareth Reese, the senior project manager for the city of Mercer Island, called. He had just heard my comment that I had the drawings which he had been searching for at City Hall. With the help of Robin Russell, the plans were de delivered, to delivered to City Hall for Gareth to copy electronically and share with Anais Adanska, the project architect selected by the city for the thrift shop recycling center renovation. I am delighted that Osborne Architects Incorporated was selected for this project, and specifically that Anais Adamska is the project architect. When I asked her if she had worked on historical renovation projects, she responded, quote, I have worked on many historic projects and am excited to bring the recycling center back to use, end quote. So I too am very excited that the renovation of our own historic Mercer Island Recycling Center will be in her hands. In addition to the architectural drawings, Anais mentioned that photographs of the construction would be helpful to the structural engineer. I have shared with her a selection of historic images along with a link to the video about the origin, construction, operation, and history of the recycling center. I selected just five of these images to share with you this evening. These are the tip of the iceberg. I have four storage boxes of files, photographs, and records of the recycling center vision, planning, construction, and operation that were given to me by Mike Levitt after his father, Harry Levitt, passed away. Although you have the pictures forwarded to you by the city clerk, Without video access, the public cannot see them. However, the images, along with the text of this and other appearances, will be posted soon on the website, www.protectmiparks.org. I'll read the captions of the photographs now. First one, these four members of the Mercer Island High School Student Committee to Save the Earth, who worked on building the brand new recycling center, are shown in front of the structure just after its completion in 1975. On the left is Bobby Morgan. The third from the left is Bill Hockburn. Please let me know if you can identify the other two. Second photograph, Governor Jan Evans awards the 1976 Washington State Environmental Excellence Award to MIHS student Bill Hockburn, representing the Student Committee to Save the Earth. Number three, the cover image for a video about the history of the Mercer Island Recycling Center. Number four, the architect James Adkins gives Meg Lippert his architectural drawings for the Mercer Island Recycling Center on May 8th 2017. Hey, do you have 30 seconds? I'm sorry. Panel participants for a community workshop on revisioning the recycling center that was held at Mercer Island Library on September 17, 2019, standing in front of the recycling center they helped to build over 40 years before, who is the architect and four former students. The award winning recycling center is an intergenerational, volunteer based community effort that has served Islanders well for over 44 years and we hope that the city council will continue its purpose and legacy long into the future. Thank you very much and thank you for including the option to be videoed during appearances in the next meeting. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Meg. Mr. Mayor, the next person on our list is Robin Russell. Robin, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Robin Russell and I live on Mercer Island. I am very concerned about the expansion of the thrift store and the historic recycle center. What analysis has been done to support this expansion? With the pandemic, all retail stores, including thrift stores, are opening with a completely different model. Many retailers have filed bankruptcy or are closing many of their stores. The stores are limiting access and phasing out products to help keep the stores clean. The thrift store is a very unique as they are taking in used products and reselling them. This process will have to be changed dramatically because of COVID-19. 
there will be increased staff, so increased costs to run. And the big question is, will customers even come back into the store? Most older people aren't even leaving their residence or their, their retirement homes or residence. Online shopping has increased dramatically, which could have a huge impact on the thrift store. With the implosion of the Main Street project, the city is now left with a $2 million piece of polluted property, not to mention the thousands of dollars that was spent on the project and increased staff time. Jumping into the thrift store and recycle project now and spending almost a million dollars or maybe even more at this time when there are so many unknowns and the city revenues are down makes no sense. Lastly, I'm very concerned about the increased traffic around, in and around and through Mercerdale Park. Mercerdale Park has been under attack for many decades from the proposal of City Hall moving to the park and the proposal of the fire department and most recently a 35,000 square foot performing arts center. Any work or expansion at the thrift store or historic recycle center must include protecting and preserving all parkland, including the native garden. Mercer Dale Park is a place of respite and serenity that is enjoyed by all residents, especially those that don't have a yard of their own. In conclusion, I strongly advise refocusing away from expansion and focus on the thrift store and the new processes that will need to be put into place to make the store, clerks, volunteers, and customers safe. When the store reopens and if customers, customer base and revenues return to a sustainable level that makes sense financially, only then should you move forward. Mercer Island has many examples of failed and almost failed projects of quote, if you build it, they will come. Just look at the community center, which is supported by our tax dollars. And we all know that if MICA had been built in the park, it too would have looked to the city for support, especially during the pandemic. The city already supports the thrift store financially. Uh, yeah, and if this, I'm sorry, is, yeah. if, if this expansion goes forward, it most certainly will, have incre will increase their financial commitment. There are many unknowns in our community today and gambling yet another $1 million of our tax dollars now, especially now, is something all council members and the city managers should, should not support. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, city Clerk, um, has Ms. Smith joined uh, the meeting? I don't see that she has, Mayor. Um, I did email her and there wasn't a response to the email either. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, if there are no further appearances, we will now move to the consent calendar. The next item of business is the approval of the consent calendar. Uh, the consent calendar contains the approval of the accounts payable reports for the periods ending July 17 and July 24, 2020. The approval of the minutes of the meeting on July 14. The approval of the certification of payroll dated July 31, 2020. Uh, approval of uh, AB 5733, the building access control system bid award. And the approval of uh, AB 5734, the appropriation of synthetic turf sinking fund for the South Mercer turf placement, replacement, sorry. Does anybody wish to pull anything off the consent calendar? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented? So moved. Second. second. Okay, uh, it's been moved by council member Neese and seconded by council member Reynolds to approve the consent calendar. City clerk, will you conduct a roll call please? Councilmember Jacobson. Councilmember Jacobson. Aye. Councilmember Neese. Aye. Councilmember Rosenbaum. Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker. Aye. Councilmember Anderl. Aye. Councilmember Reynolds? Aye. And Mayor Wong? Aye. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the first item of regular business, which is Agenda Bill 5720, the Zayo franchise. This is the first reading. And to lead the discussion uh, presentation, welcome Interim Community Planning and Development Director Patrick Yamashita. 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of the City Council. For the record, I'm Patrick Yamashita, your City Engineer and the Interim Director of Community Planning and Development. The agenda bill before you is the first reading for the ZAO Franchise Agreement. Staff worked with outside counsel Daniel Kenny from Ogden Murphy Wallace to negotiate the agreement with ZAO on behalf of the city. I'd like to introduce Daniel, who will be presenting this item and responding to your questions. Welcome, Daniel. Thank, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I saw a couple, a couple of thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Daniel Kenny. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Ogden Murphy Wallace. I'm in their municipal, municipal group and um, we represent uh, a whole host of cities in the Puget Sound area and also do specialty work. And one of those things is to help uh, different jurisdictions, whether there are clients or specialty clients to work on telecommunications matters. And so um, I'm here today and I've been working with the city on this franchise agreement um, to negotiate it with Zayo. Um, Zayo approached the city uh, for this agreement and uh, the city brought me on to help work with that. So I have a PowerPoint that I'm gonna put on the screen now. Um, if anybody can't hear me or can't see a slide moving or something like that, please feel free to unmute and give me a holler. I think it's gonna cover up my screen while I've got it on the screen share. And then I'll come back to this video presentation to answer your questions and talk about the process a little bit more. So let me share the screen right now. One moment, please. Okay, so it, you should have on the screen before you right now, just my PowerPoint slide, Zao Franchise Ordinance 20-16. We got Again, it. Again, another thumbs up maybe. Yeah. Perfect, okay, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, I will continue on here. Okay, so just a little bit of background on this franchise agreement. Zao approached the city approximately um, a year ago requesting a franchise agreement. Um, uh, it was a, a little under a year ago now, um, and they desired to install into the city's rights of way uh, new wireline facilities. I'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but it's basically fiber optic, fiber optic it's data connections, uh, which will initially serve existing facilities um, which currently have outdated or slow connections. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to speed up uh, the connections at existing cell sites on, on the island uh, to provide uh, better and faster service uh, to customers on the island. Um, uh, an important note, because I know this comes up in, in cities uh, all across the country right now, this agreement would not allow small wireless facilities. So this is just a wireline agreement. Um, I know that that's uh, an important thing. You, you do have one small wireless uh, facility and wireline combo franchise that the council approved not too long ago. This is different than that. So just wanna make that uh, clarification known. Uh, the application was received in January 2020. Um, the city went back and forth and got some revisions to make it uh, complete. And that was deemed complete in February 2020. Um, and so, We've been working with Zayo since that time um, to negotiate the agreement, um, to get an agreement that works for the city's interest, but then also for Zayo. They've been a great partner in those discussions and certainly would thank them for their uh, efforts in those discussions along the way. Um, and of course, with COVID, things were a little stop and start for uh, how this could come to council, um, but it's here before you tonight um, for your consideration. Um, some additional information. Um, RCW 35A 47040 allows the city to uh, grant franchises. Uh, a franchise is the general right of access to the right of way. It is not a specific permit for any installation. Um, and it is a general right of access to all of the rights of way. So we'll see a map here in a second about um, some proposed locations. They could expand beyond that or deviate from that, but they've been kind enough to provide to the city some information on what they expect uh, to do uh, with this franchise, at least straight away. So again, Zayo will be coming into the city and will need to apply for all the permits for the, for the installation of their wireline facil facilities, any public works permits, construction permits, if necessary, uh, they would need to get. And um, one quick note on the first bullet, as you noted in the agenda bill tonight, 
this is your first reading on this. Franchises under Washington law require two readings. So the um, kind of the action item for this evening would be to have your discussion and to then bring it back for a second reading where it could be approved. Um, and that is typically the more straightforward process. This would be the discussion, and that's just a product of state law. Um, I just wanted to note really quickly there on that thir third bullet point that the city does have a whole range of um, franchises uh, for access to its rights of way with different entities of different types. Um, the ones that are probably um, most similar to this are going to be with Comcast for cable, CenturyLink, Crown Castle. That's the one that I mentioned that had both small wireless facilities and wireline facilities. You also have things like power, gas, and garbage collection. And so um, franchises are a very normal thing for cities to adapt uh, for a whole host of different types of utilities and um, companies that would access the right of way uh, in a similar fashion. So again, as I noted before, uh, Zao has provided the city with uh, information on its proposed initial deployment. I'll remind you that the franchise itself is a general right of access and th this is in, uh, in the, as an exhibit in the franchise. So if you would like to look closer, I, I, I see some people looking uh, closely. Uh, it is an exhibit to the franchise. But again, I want to note um, that this is intended to be their proposed initial deployment. That could change, um, and that would be perfectly fine. It also could expand over time, which it also would be totally fine. For all of that, they will be coming into the city for their permits to make the actual installations. Um, this is just a great tool. What this depicts is the path that they are uh, intending to take or hope to take to connect up those eight existing locations with the high-speed uh, data. And so, again, what they're trying to do is connect those eight locations so that they have more speed uh, and can provide better service on the island um, to, to all of your residents. Um, they initially reached out right at the beginning, obviously, of the um, COVID situation and everybody was going home. So they um, quickly addressed and identified the, the need for, for data for people to work from home, as, as I think we're all doing right now, um, and to be on their different devices. Um, and again, additional deployments would be covered by this franchise as well. So I wanted to go through a few of the common common questions that I get on franchise agreements from um, a lot of the cities that I work with. Um, and so we can talk about these in more detail once I wrap up, but I just wanted to kind of quickly go through these. Um, is this franchise consistent with treatment of other franchises? Yes. Um, this was um, uh, templated um, in large part, at least, on the existing Crown Castle franchise, which is an approved franchise by the city of Mercer Island. Um, and so that is uh, kind of um, one of the ways that we can uh, treat people equally. There is, uh, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, the, the, the um, principle of competitive equity. We really should be treating these uh, similarly situated entities in a similar way so that we're not um, giving anybody any sort of business advantage or anything uh, like that. That's not uh, the role of the city, clearly. Um, so, so the answer is yes to this. Um, I clump these two together, they have to do with uh, fees and charges. Can the city charge an ongoing fee for the franchise? This is typically considered to be a franchise fee, and the answer is no. Given the type of business um, that they are operating, um, we cannot charge a franchise fee. However, um, the second question, will they be responsible for the city's costs in reviewing and approving this franchise? The answer is yes. While, we, that while the city is not able to charge a franchise fee, they are allowed to charge for actual administrative costs incurred by the city in the review and approval of the franchise. And that's again by state, both of these are by state law. Um, Zayo at the time of their application provided a fee deposit check. And so the city already received a check of $7,500 um, at the outset of the process. And the city will work uh, its uh, fees down from that check if there's money left over, it'll go back to Zao. If there is more due and they are considered uh, actual administrative costs, then Zao would receive that final invoice for whatever that remaining amount would be. Um, and so for uh, the city will be um, made whole, if you will, for the process and frankly, my time uh, that went into this process uh, over the last few months. 
can the city deny a request for a franchise? This is a common question. Um, I want to um, put a, a strong word of caution on this. While the answer is technically yes, it would be very challenging and I personally strongly discourage that path, at least in this moment. Um, first, um, it, if, if you did go down that path, it would have to be supported by substantial evidence in the written record. Um, so it's not just a, on the whim, we don't wanna do this. There has to be substantial evidence to, to do it. Um, and if that were the case, the remedy for Zao would be to go to court. So we're not looking at that right now, definitely. Um, but further, as I mentioned earlier, there's competitive equity between telecoms. You already have entities in your right of way that have been given franchises for similar use of the right of way. And so we need to keep those similarly situated entities on a, on a common uh, playing field, if you will. So we're working forward with our discussion tonight on first reading moving towards second. And of course, if you have any thoughts on this franchise, that's the, the whole purpose of this discussion right now. Um, what discretion does the city have to modify the franchise? Um, this is a great question. The, the city drove this process and to get to where we are now. So the city has total discretion, but, but of course there are some you know, bounds in that process. Um, we were working with that competitive equity in mind using some of our prior documents. There are state law that controls a number of the different provisions that we're working with in this document. Um, so while, of course, we, you know, we drafted a document that we thought that you would find acceptable for the city for your consideration and approval, we did negotiate that with Zao because they have their interests in mind and we went back and forth in a collaborative process to find that middle ground where it works for both the city and Zao would then accept it and be able to use that franchise. So it absolutely started and I believe finished in a position where the city had its um, uh, interest put into that document. You absolutely could uh, direct staff to continue to review certain sections. If you had certain uh, opinions that you wanted to pass on tonight, we could make those modifications. Assuming Zao would be agreeable to those, it would be a continued negotiation and we could bring it back for second reading. Um, and so it just depends on where those conversations go. But the document before you, uh, I would, uh, put forward as a, a, a document that is uh, in the best interest of the city and that would allow Zao to move forward into the rights of way in a similar way as some of the other entities that have done so in the past. So I, I've been talking pretty quick and I think that was my, my last slide. The next step is to set this ordinance for second reading and adoption on September 1, that's when it's currently scheduled. We will of course have this discussion now and if anything uh, needs to be fleshed out, we can do that. At this time, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we have the videos back. If at any time I need to put something back up, please just let me know and I can do that. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. So, yeah. I don't see, one second. Um, Deb, can I ask, here, here's a question. This might be for the tech person. Um, on my screen, when I'm looking for people raising their hands, somebody has raised their hands, but the person is not identified, so I can't tell which council member is raising his or her hand. This is a fun. Is that making sense? Yeah, I I see, Mr. Mayor, that we have um, something has happened between the last meeting and this one, and all of you are just identified as council member instead of by your name. Right. <laughs> I'm not. But uh, I'm looking at it says council. Yeah, it does it just say council member? Um, I'm not sure we can correct that on the fly, so we may have to go back to old fashioned, old -fashioned hand raising. Way. Apologies. <laughs> if I could just offer one um, yes. suggestion, council members, if you um, can, if you click on council member, right click, and it should give you the option to, you'll see uh, a mute button and a more button. And the more button gives you an opportunity to rename it. So you can rename it and give yourself um, a council member niece or council member Anderl. Well, uh, council member niece just did it so okay great there you go and does that mean you're calling on me well you know i am going to call on you first even though you probably weren't first but no uh the fact that you got there first i appreciate it so council member uh niece so daniel thanks for the presentation i wanted to ask if you could just speak to the fact as to whether the existing cell sites have fiber who's providing it and why is there a need to replace it with additional fiber? Because I assume it's it's already up and running. 
and maybe I'm totally wrong, maybe that's not the case. Yeah, so um, so the sites are up and running. Um, the sites are d identified on um, the map that's both part of uh, the franchise and the packet that I had on the screen. Um, they are currently connected with uh, lower speeds um, and so would be swapped out with higher speed data. Um, I do not know who is currently operating those. Um, Zeo is... Uh, Sorry, stepping into that role, um, and so Zeo does, is not currently serving those sites right now. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I think maybe you had a third question. Well, so the the follow up will be uh, if they are connected with a lower speed, is it by choice or is it because the bandwidth is not available or in the capacity of the fiber that, that is there already? So when um, I get my if, internet, I, I have choices of three, four, five, six different speeds. They all have a different price point. Are they constrained by what they're willing to pay or are they constrained by the infrastructure that's servicing the site? Uh, great question. My understanding is that it's the infrastructure serving the site. The lines are just dated lines and they need to be updated to a faster and higher capacity line. Um, and uh, Zeo is the entity that can provide that line to those existing sites. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Reynolds. Yeah, one incredibly ignorant question to start with. Um, the lines that are there, I just want to make sure I understand what they're for. So is the idea that if I make a call on my cell phone, it's going to a cell tower somewhere, and then this is then connecting the, the, the phone signal, it's going on from the tower on these fiber lines, is that the idea? Uh, yes, so, so the sites that are being connected with these fiber lines are uh, cell sites that are currently existing that yes, you would connect to using your devices and this is the infrastructure that makes that all happen. Okay, Mayor, can I ask one other quick question or are we limited to one? Um, I'll assume it's a clarifying question, so go ahead. But it, it's unrelated, so you can circle back to me if you want. Well, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, just. You indicated that the, the final application was submitted in February. It's now August, uh, which makes it sound like there was a lot of negotiation that happened, but also this principle of competitive equity sounds like there's very little wiggle room in the negotiations. So what happened in that time? What were the contentious issues or what single things you could point to? Um, that, that's a good question. I think that the majority of the time span was given the pivot to uh, remote meetings and the limitation, if you recall, on what council could consider. And there, you had to have uh, meet a certain threshold under state pro or the governor's proclamations to uh, consider items. And so we had to wait until um, just, uh, I, I, this is not meant to diminish it at all, but normal things could be considered by the council, not things related to COVID um, and, and whatnot. Um, and certainly Zayo um, has the position that this is related to COVID, that they wanted to move forward real quick, but in consultation um, with city attorney uh, Beale Park, um, you know, we made the determination that, that that didn't make sense for the city. It was not something that rose to that level. And so the majority of the kind of pause, if you will, was related to that. Um, the rest of the negotiations, um, I would not characterize as, you know, any contentious items or anything like that. It does take just some time to work through um, drafts and to get their legal review and to get our legal review on sections like indemnification and insurance um, and undergrounding and, and things like that. But um, I think that the process worked well. And frankly, one of the things that um, took a little bit of time and I think it was on both sides and no delay or anything like that um, was getting uh, a map that we thought would be uh, as useful for you. Zale worked very hard um, to create that map to make sure that you had a clear understanding of what was going where and how. And so we certainly thank them for their efforts on that. I know that the city um, wanted to focus on that to make sure that the residents on the call and, and yourselves um, had a clear understanding of what that looked like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Deputy Mayor Weichmann. Thanks for the presentation, Daniel. So in an effort to sort of set expectations, the map that shows underground and aerial, can you give us a preview of coming attractions and what aesthetics and um, work and end result islanders might be able to expect who live near these rights of way? 
Um, well, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I think the easiest thing for me would be to say that any installation would have to be consistent with code, and uh, those installations would, um, well, I, I was going to say largely be consistent with what's out there, but some, some of those are over different periods of time, so I, I don't want to uh, pigeonhole it to that. But um, it would be consistent with code. They need permits to, to install it, um, and they would have to work with um, public works and planning to go through that process. The specifics of that's not included here. Um, this kicks to code requirements for things like that. This is just the general access right uh, to the right of way. A clarifying question, just for example, we might see another wire hanging between poles. We might see a trench dug and then planted over with trees or sidewalks again. Oh, whatever, it, right? Like, sure, yes, okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. So so essentially, it's an additional wire um, that could be between poles, kind of like you see out there now, that could be trenched underground. Um, there are uh, provisions in here about when those things would happen and how. So, for example, um, trying to minimize cuts to the road, so uh, trenchless, trenchless boring, as an example, um, or if it's going to be uh, above ground. Um, as you saw on that map, they indicate both aerial and underground in certain locations. Um, and the city has reviewed that and generally thinks that that looks fine and consistent with the, what's out there right now. Um, should future projects happen, um, city projects for road work or things like that, they're required under this agreement to move their facilities. They might put them back, they might have to go someplace else. It depends on the situation. And so we've tried to touch on those scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Jacobson. Jack, you're on mute. Will Iseo, uh wiring be run parallel to existing or does it replace existing? Uh, my understanding is that they don't have any wiring out there right now. And so their request under the franchise and their future permits would be for new additional wiring that is theirs. Um, whether or not that may result in other wiring that's currently feeding those eight sites um, to be not needed anymore by another entity, I, I, I'm not aware of that. But the, their their franchise and their permits would be for their own new wires. Okay. Um, the uh, on the insurance section, uh, <clears throat> which I believe is section 18 of the agreement, uh, and specifically section 18.5 talks about additional insureds. Uh, the uh, was the was the was the idea of having the city named as a primary additional insured without right of contribution. That language considered. <clears throat> The, the the insurance language was uh, from uh, the city's insurance carrier to or the pool to make sure that it's consistent with the requirements. Um, we. Whenever I write one of these, that's the initial first place that I pivot a section is to make sure that it is consistent with how everything should be for the city and with the uh, other agreements in place. And so that is the current language as recommended uh, by the pool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rosenbaum. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Thanks for the presentation. Um, not sure if you can get into this question, but I do see that there's someone from Zao on the line here. Maybe they can follow up with us. Um, what would be the time frame that we would expect to see, assuming this is, uh, you know, all buttoned up by our next meeting, um, when would we start to see permits coming in? Um, and then sort of following up on, on Wendy's question, when would we start to see um, construction um, underway? So, um, Zao, for, I, it, I'll give you my answer, and, and if you'd like for us to call on the Zao representative, I'm not sure if they'll be able to give a better answer, but from the very beginning of our discussions at the early part of the year, um, they indicated an interest to do this very quickly, and so had they um, been able to, they would have taken a franchise in March. Um, and then would have wanted to install. And of course, I, I, I can't guarantee that um, uh, because th that was the representation made. Um, and I think, you know, they have the ability to connect these sites. 
um, and um, the the directive to do that is my understanding. And so I would expect that once this is approved, that they would be approaching the city quickly to make that installation, uh, and that would include building, uh, uh, pulling permits and starting construction. Um, again, I can't guarantee how quickly, but th that certainly something that they brought up on multiple occasions is their keen interest to get this done. I only ask because, you know, a lot of these are pretty popular walking rides these days. Um, so I just want to make sure we're being you know, cognizant of that, um, especially around the permits. I make sure people aren't, you know, walking around walking the middle of the road here. So um, I guess they're more for us to be mind up. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Wiper, you have your hands up, and I'm going to take a turn before we go to the second round. And so, um, again, uh, Mr. Kenny, thank you for your presentation. I, I'm just curious. You already mentioned the insurance and indemnification. Are there other provisions in this agreement that the city, in your opinion, might have an opportunity to look at, to change terms, whatever? I'm, you know, I'm thinking in terms of the 10-year term, the two-year warranty, and then, of course, you mentioned the insurance and indemnification. Are there other provisions, other decisions that we can make as a city that might impact or change this agreement? Um, a great question. I, I think, you know, many of those um, in consultation with staff who I worked directly with throughout the whole process um, were already made. Things like um, the, the trees on public property, the tree trimming uh, requirements to make sure that they're coming in and they're giving notice and getting a permit before they're cutting trees. Um, I know that's an important thing in communities like yours in the Northwest that value their trees. Um, things like undergrounding and relocation, making sure some of that's dictated by state law, but just making sure that it's structured in a way that a city project can move forward properly and without delay, um, that if there's an issue that they're gonna pay for it um, and undergrounding requirements. So, you know, um, I, I would say that we tried to put our, our, our touch, if you will, on the vast majority of these sections um, in the city's interest. Um, and had good productive conversations with Zao uh, along the way to uh, to get to where we are now. And I'm just quickly scrolling through to see if there's any others that really caught my eye. Um, let me just see here. Um, of course, the insurance indemnification, like I said, we try to keep that pretty standardized for the city from, from the pool. Um, and then making sure that it's updated to include um, you know, um, permitting requirements and process and things like that from the code. But again, that's all pretty straightforward, uh, restoration. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of, I, I hate to say this, but like the first half or third that, that's got a little bit more of the interesting stuff um, for, for that perspective. But again, I, I worked with um, the works director, community development director, and your city attorney uh, along the way to, to kind of flesh those things out. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker. I'm uh, muted. Oh, so, uh, thanks, Daniel. I'm just curious what would happen between now and September 1st, second reading. Like, what, what value can we add? Is there a public input process? Um, it seems to me if we want to get going on some of this infrastructure work, it might be beneficial to waive a second reading. Can you tell me what advantage or so, disadvantage there might be to that? Um, uh, one disadvantage is that it's required by state law. So I, I apologize. Um, so, oh, so you, wow. you do need, yeah. So, so you do need a second reading. The language on that, I don't have it in front of me. is very, um, it's very odd. It's, um, it's something like, uh, can't be brought up in anything but a regular meeting and then have to wait five days to approve or something. So the practical result is that it is two, two council meetings, uh, a first read and a second read. Um, so the goal of staff was to, um, I think, you know, position it on uh, agendas that made made sense, and so I defer to them on the exact timing for the second read. Um, yeah. Well, we're not coming back till September, so fine. Thank you. That's oh, great. that's. A, I, I was thinking that that might be the case, but I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Nice. Daniel, I, you had mentioned earlier the this principle of equity and between uh, Crown Castle versus this applicant. And I'm not sure that you had the background on the genesis of the of the Crown Castle agreement, but it was written by the franchise applicant and then adopted by the city after edits. So it wasn't that that is the best 
uh, template best form for what the city of Mercer Island would necessarily use. It was just what was used, I think, at the time. So I wanted to ask if you had you know, looked at that with the critical eye of, is this really the best template? I mean, if Crown Castle is the precedent for this document, this document will be precedent for the next document. Uh, I wanted to make sure first off that you understood that wasn't the case. And that really, is this, a, is this gonna be the form that we use going forward? Is this really the best that we can do? Uh, Great question, and, and it gives me the opportunity to clarify. I, I, we referred to it, it was not the baseline document, but in terms of um, seeing how the city had handled this type of situation in the past, it was the baseline. Um, so um, we've worked on agreements like this for uh, quite a few jurisdictions, and so I worked off of a number of templates, finding those provisions that I thought um, mattered the most. Competitive equity does not necessarily mean it has to be word for word. It means that you can't give it that competitive advantage. And so there will be differences, absolutely. Like you, you wouldn't want to do a, a comparadox version of this with the Crown Castle by any means. There's not you know, sections. There may be a, a couple that I grabbed. I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a reference point, not a baseline document. However, your point is well taken that um, as you start to adopt these agreements over time um, for similarly, similarly situated entities, you do set the table to some extent. And so you want to be mindful of that as, as you go forward. And I think that um, we certainly took that into account when we were drafting this to make sure that um, we were um, preserving cities, the city's rights um, for, for important things in the future. Yeah, and so the follow along on that would be that in in looking at how the Crown Castle franchise agreement was implemented, there was a definition, uh, there was a term for an underground utility area that had no definition. And it became kind of known to us that the, under the franchise agreement, they could run overhead lines in underground areas. Now it's slightly different because you're dealing with a wireless infrastructure versus uh, this, which is a wired structure. but. I'm sure that there are citizens out there tonight that are wondering if I live in a neighborhood that has only underground utilities, would this franchise agreement allow this applicant to come through and run an overhead line? Uh, no, the, the answer, oh, I, I see uh, um, City Attorney Park jumped on it if he wants to uh, cut me off, but, but no, there is an, un sorry. Council Member Nisa, the Crown Castle um, franchise agreement, um, it, as it pertains to area where lines are undergrounded, the only um, requirement, the only allowance um, for above ground feature is the antenna itself. It's not the line. The line itself has to be underground. The line that feeds to the antenna needs to be underground. But because the antenna cannot be undergrounded, that's why it, it gives an allowance to be above ground but everything else under the Crown Castle uh, franchise, it needs to be undergrounded. So we won't have that problem with this franchise agreement because it's a, a wire? We should not. And I'll look to, to Daniel to confirm that. Yes, uh, thanks you. thank you so much. Um, so section six is the undergrounding of facilities. And it starts with the premise that except as authorized by a permit, it should go underground. Um, the, uh, in consultation with uh, city staff, public works director, community development director, uh, now one and the same is my understanding, um, uh, there are certain locations that they are going to be pursuing to go above ground. And that's um, something that the city thought was fine because of the uh, nature of those areas. But we do have provisions on how that will be done if an area does go underground in the future, how that will be handled. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's all been taken into account. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Jacobson. <clears throat> My questions have to do with section 8.7 on tree trimming and uh, specifically 8.7B, which is trees on private property. Uh, for those of us who live in uh, overhead line venues, um, the, uh, all the wires that are on those poles are put in an easement that Puget Sound Energy says that they have. So my first question is, uh, and the problem that comes up is that 
Puget Sound Energy says we can trim any tree we want. It's an easement and, uh, you know, see you later. And when they came along my street, they not only wanted to trim things that affected their their uh, power lines, which are the highest on the pole, but everybody else's, which would have resulted in just one siding a tree. Uh, and after some uh, friendly discussion, that didn't happen. But uh, if that's a concern that, that, that I would have uh, that, in fact, how are we going to, or the uh, 8.7B, B1, be enforced? And I'm not sure how we do that. Do we go to the city attorney and say, hey, they're out here, they want to prune trees on my property, and I want them to do it? Because they they take, and, and Puget Sound does, and take, take the limb right back to the tree, even though that limb may only have three feet of uh, uh, intrusion on on the the area of the easement so at any rate i see that as a problem i'm not i'm not sure how well this deals with it so have you had experience so, so, with um, um, great great question um there is a uh, distinction between um, a power utility under state law and zeo in this situation and so those allowances that um you've heard about for tree trimming for a power utility are not available to Zao, and Zao would have to work under the provisions here. Um, and so really it is, it, it's a different framework. Um, absolutely, one of the reasons why we included this is because we know that things like that either can happen or are concerns of the community. And so we wanna make sure that it is clearly defined on you know what the expectations are for tree trimming. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, I wanna take a turn. And so I guess, kind of a, a broader question and then a specific one, and maybe tying back to what uh, Councilmember Jacobson uh, raised. Uh, is there a dispute resolution process if, if the city and ZAO have a conflict? That's kind of more specific. And then obviously you've been focused on this competitive equity concept, which is understandable, but I'm curious if you can, if there are any material differences between I guess some of these other contracts, uh, franchise agreements, I guess in particular Crown Castle, have you highlighted them or can you highlight them for the council? And I'm gonna get back to my first question was, where are the decision points that we actually have a right or an ability to make? And again, that is something that maybe we can take a look at um, between now and the second reading. But anyway, if you can answer or at least address some of the questions I have. Uh, absolutely. Um, th there were a lot of different questions there, so I apologize if I if I don't no, have I one uh, as I'm. Yeah. No, no, no. It's great. Um, uh, it's great to have the questions. Um, so there is. Um, I, I think I'm starting in the beginning. Section 21 remedies to enforce compliance. Um, to be totally honest, I haven't reviewed that uh, recently. Uh, frankly, it doesn't come up too often. So, um, but that is included uh, in the in the agreement um, to deal with situations that may come up. Um, in terms of areas to think about in your review, um, that that's actually a really tough question because there's a there's a mixture of both um, kind of things that have been set on the table and then uh, state and federal law that could touch on things. I think I would encourage you that if you do have an area that you have comments on, to pass those comments along to staff. I can work with staff to provide a comment directly to you um, to, to let you know kind of what the lay of the land on that particular area is. And of course, we could try to do that here uh, if, you, if you chose to, or we could do that in the interim before the next meeting, before that packet is published. Um, and um, to the extent that there is um, sections that you do find that have the ability to be changed and you have ideas on that, we could compile uh, track changes or something like that for the, for the next reading or to distribute in advance um, individually, um, wh whatever makes the most sense. And I, you, you probably had one more and I can't remember what it was. I no, no, it, it was similar. It's just the idea of the, if you can identify any material differences between this, co this particular contract and the other ones, because you're obviously you're concerned about competitive equity. So, and yeah, I, I mean, really, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, really, the main one that makes it um, 
arguably um, different as not a similarly situated entity is that that other one for Crown Castle was um, for small wireless facilities as well. And so um, we don't we don't need to distinguish because um, we're not in a point where there's any you know reason to do that. Um, but uh, because they have the small wireless facilities as uh, City Attorney Park uh, identified, um, they have a whole different set of um, pieces of infrastructure, equipment, antennas that would be up on poles in the rights of way, um, in addition to the wires. And so they're gonna have a whole different set of requirements for installation and, and, and whatnot. And when they go away, removal, all that stuff. Um, so really, we, t we, we take that agreement and we strip it down to its basics of just thinking about that wire. Um, and so that's the primary difference between the two agreements. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, and if you do have other questions, uh, it sounds like you know we can certainly forward them on to the city attorney and you know forward them on to uh, Mr. Kinney. Um, seeing nobody else's hands raised, I certainly would entertain a motion um, to set the ordinance for a second reading. Moved. I grabbed that again. Okay, so it's been moved by Councilmember Reynolds and second by Councilmember Meese to um, set ordinance number 20 16 for second reading and adoption on September 1, 2020. Uh, City Clerk, please conduct the roll call. Councilmember Rosenbaum? Aye. Mayor Wong? Aye. Councilmember Andrell? Aye. Councilmember Neese? Aye. Councilmember Jacobson? Aye. Councilmember Reynolds? Aye. And Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. Thank you for your time. It was nice to meet you all remotely. Thank you. Okay, the... Uh, Second item of regular business is agenda bill 5737, emergency ordinance 20C-17 to temporarily allow private parking and right of way use by businesses to meet safe start plan guidelines. And we welcome back in realm community planning and development director Patrick Yamashita and EOC small business liaison, Sarah Blubis. Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to take this and uh, get Patrick off the hook tonight. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. For the record, I'm Sarah Blubus, the Small Business Liaison for the City's Emergency Operations Center. And we're going to be reviewing uh, this emergency ordinance to allow some private parking and right-of-way use by businesses to facilitate outdoor seating. So let me share my screen very quickly. All right, can you all see my screen? Uh, yes. All right, terrific. Um, so hopefully this will go pretty quickly. I know you all have a lot more on your plates this evening, uh, but the main thing that we're asking for this evening is for you all to adopt our temporary ordinance that will remove some barriers to allow us to facilitate more outdoor seating for local restaurants and other eating and drinking establishments on the island. Um, I'm sure you all are very aware that our local eateries have been some of the most hard hit businesses during the pandemic. They were instructed to close back in March 15th. Uh, restaurants were able to you know, pivot to do takeout and delivery. Um, some of our more bar establishments were able to reopen by doing delivery service and the city also worked with those groups to provide a variety of options, um, including things like the Takeout Tuesday social media campaign and expediting requests for off-premise uh, endorsements to allow deliveries from businesses like Barrels and other alcohol deliveries. So tonight, the reason we're kind of bringing this up um, is some additional restrictions now part of phase two. As you all recall, we are in phase two of the Safe Start Plan, which allowed several businesses to reopen under limited operations. And as of the last two weeks, there have been additional restrictions uh, levied on food and drinking establishments during this phase. 
On July 23rd, um, there were additional limits placed on indoor dining, only limiting it to restaurants and members of the same household through phase four, prohibiting bar seating area or bar area seating and prohibiting indoor service at taverns, breweries, wineries, and distilleries. Now, I know we don't have any breweries, wineries, or distilleries on the island, but some of the um, drinking, food and drinking establishments on the island do qualify as tavern, taverns and obviously restaurants. So a lot of businesses that are being impacted. Also last week, um, the governor indefinitely paused the Safe Start advancement. So King County is remaining in phase two until further notice. So our businesses are going to be dealing with these additional restrictions for um, an unknown amount of time. Within all of that, we've received requests from these businesses for additional outdoor seating. And these have come in the form of primarily two requests. So the use of public right-of-way sidewalk or parking um, spaces, and then the use of private sidewalk or parking space. Uh, these requests have primarily come from town center businesses, although I know that our businesses on the south end are also interested in the opportunity for more outdoor seating. And then we've also been, you know, seeing a lot of other communities implement similar solutions uh, based on, you know, their downtown core and their business makeup, seeing a lot of uh, street cafes, sidewalk cafes, what Seattle calls the parklet, uh, all the way up to streeteries, which has basically been shutting down entire streets in some communities in order to facilitate more outdoor seating. So internally as staff, we've been looking at what options would work best both for our uh, town center design as well as what our businesses need right now. And enter ordinance number 20C-17. So this ordinance is in your agenda packet. Um, I won't go into too much detail into it unless you need me to. Hopefully you had the opportunity to review before tonight. But there are three key pieces that hopefully get at those um, needs related to right of way use and private parking. So the first is amending MICC 1906-050, which pertains to commerce on public property. Uh, it authorizes the use of private parking areas for outdoor dining and then waives the minimum parking regula regulations for the duration of the ordinance. Before I get into a little bit more detail about some of those pieces, I just wanted to bring up who this will benefit. Um, now, the image here is a map of uh, parking within our town center zone. The yellow blocks are commercial parking, so those are largely private parking zones. And then the red lines are right-of-way street parking. Um, you can see that there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, rough calculations, about 85% of the existing eating and drinking establishments on the island are adjacent to right-of-way or private parking. Both in town center, I know this map is just town center, but also on the South End. Um, so this would provide a lot of opportunity for outdoor or for businesses to expand their outdoor footprint or at least explore it as an option. And this also adds more ways for islanders to spend local while still adhering to safe start guidelines. I know uh, we're seeing more people itching to get outside and spend time and hopefully uh, support their local businesses. So hopes that um, this will provide the opportunity for more islanders to do that in a safe way. So a couple of uh, pieces that just to keep in mind, highlights from the ordinance and then I'll wrap up and we can take some questions if needed. Once the uh, ordinance is adopted, it'll remain in effect for six months or until King County moves into safe start phase four. Uh, obviously we don't have a deadline or timeline for when we'll reach phase four. So there is an option to extend the ordinance if needed. And then the associated permit uh, with the commerce on public property aspect would remain valid for the duration of the ordinance. Um, that permit for right-of-way access will be available starting tomorrow pending your approval tonight and our CPD staff are prepare, prepared to review and expedite permits um, as quickly as possible recognizing that this is a priority and we only have so many days left of our beautiful summer weather here in the northwest to take advantage of outdoor seating. One last piece of information. So there would be a cost associated with this permit. Uh, you can see the price, it's a little less than $350, but we are recommending as the final piece of action tonight that uh, we cover this permit fee with our King County CARES Act funding. Now, um, 
this may sound familiar to you or it may be new, we are bringing kind of the full suite of recommendations for our King County CARES Act funding back on September 1st. Um, but this is a piece of it that we would be able to support our small businesses um, through the end of the year. And then there would be other requirements also associated with the permit just in general um, with our permitting process, which you can see here. So these are our recommended actions tonight from your agenda bill. I'm asking that you waive the second reading of ordinance number 20C-17 pursuant to council rules 6.3 and 10.1. Adopt the ordinance, which provides these temporary measures and then authorize staff to waive the permit fee and use King County CARES Act funding to cover the cost. So I will stop sharing my screen right now because that's all I have for you. And I am happy to take any questions from you all. Great, thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, all right, oh, we do have uh, Council Member Andrew. Thank you, Mayor Wong. Um, hi, Sarah, thanks for that presentation. Um, so just to be clear, is the right of way and the private parking only available to Mercer Island businesses and do they have to be contiguous? Um, so it will need to be existing Mercer Island businesses and they will have to be adjacent to their storefront. So for instance, um, there are a couple of businesses in town center that are on 27th. So if you think about like Hudoba um, and Bennett's, if that were still open and they wanted to take advantage of this, there isn't a lot of right of way opportunity near them. Um, and so that necessarily wouldn't be something that they could take advantage of, but a business like um, Homegrown or um, the new uh, French bakery in the Boyd building, they could take advantage of this opportunity because there's enough either private parking or right of way adjacent to their business. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Jacobson. Uh, Sarah, how long do you estimate the processing and permits will take from the time one drops to the time that uh, uh, you know the permits issued and people can go ahead and arrange what they need to do to get seating. I saw that Allison Van Gorp turned her uh, video on and unmuted herself, so I will let her answer that question. Okay. Um, so this will be a permit. This is a permit type that CPD has had available for a long time, but it hasn't been used before. So it is a new process for us. Um, so I don't have an exact estimate, but we are trying to expedite these permits and get them turned around as quickly as we can. Um, the applicants need to provide some information, like a little site plan showing um, what their outdoor seating will be like. We need to make sure it meets accessibility and other kinds of fire safety requirements. So I think you know that could potentially be turned around very quickly if they're, um, application materials are complete and accurate, um, but sometimes there's a little back and forth if we need additional information that could take a bit longer. So, you know, I think it could be done as soon as within a few days, it could take a week or two, depending on how quickly we can get all the information together from the applicant. Uh, Sarah, I've got a second question that's semi-related and that is at the Boyd building, the tables that the, those merchants have uh, uh, elected to, to use for this process arrived this afternoon and await the uh, three most dreaded words in English language, some assembly required. And uh, the uh, so uh, the plan was to put those tables in an area that was uh, a city right away area that's uh, uh, not in the parking lot that a number of the uh, patrons for those businesses, whether it's Sano or the bakery or the uh, uh, place, uh, you know, any one of the businesses, Clark and Clark or uh, Barrels or people like that. Well, Barrels is a special case because of alcohol, but in any event, uh, so uh, is there just one permit needed for that whole area? So my understanding is that would be probably one permit for the entire area since it's open for all of the businesses to use. Um, okay. The caveat to that is like you already mentioned because of alcohol service with barrels and we've talked with them about this before, we would need to do um, probably a separate permitting for barrels or another organization that wants to serve alcohol um, because they're specific 
structures required. They have to fence off their area and um, submit their permit to the liquor control board and that kind of thing. So, but same same idea um, as involved with this, waiving the permit fee using King County CARES funding um, and working with those businesses to look at their site plan and review as quickly as possible. I see that city attorney has turned his screen on. Did you want to add something? Yes, uh, the, the amendment is specifically for drinking and, and uh, eating establishments. Um, so my interpretation would be that uh, each individual establishment would have to um, apply for a separate permit. It wouldn't be the, the building itself that would come in. It would be, you know, uh, if it's Sano, Sano would come in and ask for that permit. Um, and uh, if it's barrels, barrels would do the same. Well, in the case of the Boyd building, uh, you have at least three uh, entities there are putting barrels to one side for a minute that uh, have to do with food. And uh, it doesn't make much sense to have a whole lot of permits for a common table area. So they're, they're not going to put tables just out in front of the, the one or the other. They're going to use that space there uh, for all of those businesses. They have to because there's just no other way you can do it. Well, then so I... Multiple permits makes no sense then we would have to amend the uh, proposed ordinance right now to, to, to state that it's, uh, you know, either one or a group of eating and drinking establishments. May I interject as well? Uh, one of the reasons why we were proposing in the ordinance that individual permits should be required is that one of the requirements is also for uh, insurance certificate and uh, indemnification. So if there's one permit for uh, one area that several different businesses are using, but there's only one applicant that's providing the insurance and indemnification, if one of those other entities has some kind of incident or mishap, they or we may not be covered. So that's part of the thinking behind having individual permits. Okay, uh, Council Member uh, Rosenbaum, did you still have your question? Uh, no, I had some question from Jake. Um, I just want to thank everyone's, uh, everyone for their work on this, and um, you know, I hope we can get these permits turned around real quick. Uh, only have so much summer left here, so let's sort of make it worthwhile and, and have an eye to the um, later months too. Okay, I, I'm going to take a quick turn. I, I'm just curious about the certificate of insurance requirement. Um, I assume that's part of the permit, but can somebody tell me what the limits are or what do, what do we normally ask in order to protect the city? Yeah, do you want to take that? Yes, uh, it's uh, based on the recommendation of WCIA and um, I believe it's a million dollars and uh, general commercial insurance, liability insurance for a million dollars plus a um, million dollars for auto liability insurance as well. Okay, thank you. Um, is anybody else? Oh, Council Member Jacobson. Why would they post auto insurance? Because there's no automobiles involved in this. Oh, it's uh, based on the recommendation of uh, our insurance pool. So we're following that. Uh, would you send me the phone number for that? Because this, this makes no sense. Yeah. Um, City manager. Yeah, if, if I could chime in here, um, just a reminder, we're part of an um, insurance pool and um, we do require, uh, we work with them uh, in, in terms of setting our standards. It is uh, common in all of our contracts that we do require auto insurance. Uh, Council member Jacobson, I'm happy to talk with you a bit um, offline tomorrow if that would be helpful. Uh, B.O., I do have a follow-up question for you um, in terms of streamlining permit process. If, uh, if we amended the ordinance tonight to allow entities to um, share a space, uh, could we simply do so by saying all of those that intend to use the space have to meet the hold harmless requirement and provide a certificate of insurance 
um, or would it be better to have each um, entity go ahead and do their own permit application? I'm, I'm, I know that particularly at the Boyd building, uh, the, the entities that don't serve alcohol are intending to share a space. And so I just want to explore this a bit more before we move on. Right. So um, it would be just a simple um, amendment to section three of the proposed ordinance um, stating here that uh, permit applications from eating and drinking establishment um, at Mercer Island. Um, so it says one or more groups of, of, of eating and drinking establishment at Mercer Island. That would be, um, I think, a simple amendment that would clarify uh, the intent of the, of the council to allow a shared group to apply together. And then as far as indemnification and uh, insurance requirement, um, that's not actually part of the ordinance. It's part of the that's uh, the, the ordinance already provides that the city has discretion um, to require such, uh, you know, um, such, such, you know, additional securities. And so we can do that uh, internally um, with this interim CPD director. So if, if the council would like to, um make that change tonight to the emergency ordinance. Um, I just want to make sure it's understood that a group coming in under one application, uh, all of the parties would have to meet the insurance requirements. And so that would be something for uh, the businesses to consider uh, whether their partners are prepared to meet that requirement. Um, Sarah and Bio and Patrick, I have another question for you that came up in advance of the meeting was will we allow um, tents or enclosed structures as we head into the winter? Patrick, this, I, I know our fire marshal has also uh, been looking at this. Have, have we gotten much further with that yet? Yes, I spoke with the fire marshal just the other day about tents and canopies and things like that. And I think the uh, threshold is 400 square feet. If the canopy and or tent is of greater size than that, then then there are potential issues and the applicant would have to work directly with the fire marshal to figure out the ins and outs of that, but 400 square feet. So 20 by 20, 10 by 40. Okay. So it, it would be permitted under this process. It would just um, require fire marshal review. Yes. Okay. Uh, related to tents um, or any installation in the right of way, it cannot impact uh, visibility between motor motorists and pedestrians and things like that. So that okay. is one other potential depending on where the tent might be placed in the right of way. Thank you. Can I ask a question? I mean, how, I don't see anybody, nobody's hand is up, so I'll take my turn. So how difficult is this permit application process? I guess I, um, I mean, I close remember Jacobson makes a point, but it seems to me, that actually requires more coordination by the business owners. And if the permit process is not that difficult, plus I know there's another motion that talks about the potential waiving of these permit applications. I'm not sure what the, where the onus is really, um, if we have individual businesses apply for individual permits. So well, if I may, if I may, you know, take a stab at that, sorry, Sarah, um, uh, it's, you know, the way I see it, you know, there's no restriction on sharing a common space, right? Um, so if say, um, you know, Barrels and Sena you know, would say, hey, here's, you know, would submit two applications and the application would be for the same, same area, right? Um, used either together or at different, different times. Um, as long as, you know, they meet the criteria, um, there's nothing in the code that would restrict them from both applying to use the same common space, mm -hmm. right? But the way that it's written right now, we would need two applications, uh, one from, you know, one establishment and the other one from the other establishment. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I will also say that the insurance limits that WCIA has identified, I can say with fair certainty that our businesses are meeting those limits or frankly exceeding them. Uh, it's 
usually a matter of a 24 hour turn time to get uh, proof of insurance from a provider. Uh, so that that is fairly easy to expedite. Uh, we know that uh, the likely permit to come in this week will be from the Boyd building, and we're anticipating that. We've done a fair amount of site reviews, so I think as uh, Allison correctly noted, it's our desire is to do a very quick turn time, hopefully within a week. Um, and we're working directly with these applicants already in anticipation of you taking action this evening. Uh, some of the other sites in the city that we haven't studied quite as closely, we may have some additional review to do, um, but we have prioritized this in anticipation of uh, your action tonight on this ordinance. Uh, Council Member Nice. You know, when you look at this ordinance, it's, it's the bare minimum, which I respect and I appreciate. Uh, to the extent that we have a problem that needs to be addressed with a permit that is granted, do we have the ability to modify the ordinance or are they vested and is that that? Well, we, once we issue the permit, um, it, in order to um, make any changes, and I would only recommend this if there's any public safety changes, then your option um, would be to, um, to uh, you know, uh, with, withdraw this basically to terminate this ordinance, repeal the ordinance, and then replace it with something else, right? Once you repeal the ordinance, all permits issued under that ordinance would automatically expire. So is there anything that prevents a restaurant adjacent to parking from consuming all of its parking and turning that into outdoor dining? Even if it exceeds, you know, the square footage of the total restaurant by 200%, 300%? I would say that the the caveat with the private parking um, in particular is that businesses will have to work with their landlord or pro landlord or property owner in order to identify and essentially gain permission. Um, the thought there is that you know they would also work with the other businesses adjacent to them and make sure that their <laughs> neighbors are comfortable with utilizing parking, knowing that that can be an issue sometimes in town center. Um, but aside from that, and maybe Bia, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's anything that would necessarily limit how much could be taken up in the current version. That's correct. There is no restriction. So um, in the example that you gave Councilman, Council Member Nice, uh, yes, they could take up the entire parking area um, for the you know, outdoor seating. Okay. Well, I, you know, I think the likelihood of that is low, but the fact that you recognize it and you have a strategy to, to deal with it would be, uh, I guess that would satisfy me. Can I just go back again? Uh, Ray else's hand is raised. I'm just gonna ask the staff, and maybe I'm just set in this idea that there should be one permit application per, per business, I guess, as opposed to it just strikes me as it's more difficult to get these businesses perhaps to agree upon their arrangement, albeit each has to uh, satisfy the insurance requirements and the indemnification, but yet they're going to have to work together. And maybe they are working together, which is great. But uh, from the staff perspective, it doesn't matter to you guys, I, I guess. No. Sounds like you can, you don't have a preference one way or the other in terms of one permit application per business or the pooling of businesses? You know, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to add that um, I think we want to offer as much flexibility as we can for our businesses. And that to me would look like allowing a joint application uh, provided that they can each provide insurance. Um, I will tell you at the Boyd building in particular, and I know other businesses, this is true. Uh, our business community is working collaboratively together uh, it is a very difficult time right now and and so the businesses in the Boyd building are locked arm in arm saying we will do whatever we can to help each other and so I, I think we should in, in turn offer them that same flexibility um, that's that's my impression uh, Sarah and I think uh, Councilmember Jacobson and Councilmember Reynolds have been working uh, with the businesses a bit closer than I am so if I misrepresented that please uh, correct me 
it's 100 percent correct that's a good point it's, a, it's an option you can either pull together or you can just go ahead and apply individually so um i'm sorry uh bo you did um uh, uh state the possible change can you restate it or can it be put on the screen or right uh, let me um I just ask i'm trying to pull up the the proposed ordinance and it's being uh, it's opened by the city clerk if i if the city clerk could close it i, I will just closed it bill i'll make the amendment and and show it to you thank you mm -hmm. um well, while we're waiting i will also mention uh follow up to the question earlier about insurance limits um we're happy to um, circle back with WCIA tomorrow and talk about uh, minimum ex expectations for limits uh, for use of public property. L limits and coverages. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'd be happy to talk with you, uh, Jesse, about that because I, uh, I do know the Boyd building and I think you very correctly represent the <clears throat> walking together with our, our all hands together on that whole on that on that site and there the things that aren't food things uh will uh i mean there might be somebody from the uh chamber of commerce or something from um uh, clark and clark or that uh, some of the other businesses will have people out there who will who will then patronize those businesses and sit at the tables so Absolutely. they when i i've talked to just about everybody there i think and there were they're all enthusiastic about everything about it, except having to pay for the tables, but then Jim Eanes has, has purchased those. So it's, uh, that part of it's taken care of. Um, by the way, while uh, BO is working on those edits, I, whoa, we've got a big echo there. Um, just a shout out to the Boyd Building businesses. If you haven't been by lately, they've done a remarkable job um, helping us out, cleaning up <laughs> uh, some of the areas that were overrun with weeds. And uh, they've got a nice little uh, rainbow rock display. And I've seen lots of um, people stopping by to visit that. So my thanks to them. It's, it's certainly been an all hands on deck um, type of year. So much appreciation. Uh, Bio, would now be a good time to take a five minute break so you're not editing on the fly or do you have it? Oops, you're muted. I'm starting to share the screen. Can you see it? Yep. All yeah. right. So if you look at um, where I'm pointing here with my cursor, permit applications from existing eating and drinking Okay, Bio, you're muted again. Yeah, Bio, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Can't get you unmuted. Oh, there All we right. go. Okay, thank you. Well, actually, I wasn't saying anything, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but if you look at here, so let's see here, permit applications from one or a group of existing eating and drinking establishment at Mercer Island to temporarily operate private business and so forth. So that uh, clearly states or sh shows the council's intent to allow either a single establishment or a group of establishment to take advantage of this amendment. BO, if council agrees, um, can you save that as version two? Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any other um, proposed edits? Otherwise, we can start moving to the motions. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt ordinance uh, 
number uh, we have to wait the second reading first uh, Jay. okay uh, I move we waive the second reading second. okay so it, was, it was moved by council member Jacobson to waive the second reading of ordinance number 20 c-17 pursuant to rules council rules 6.3 and 10.1 and was seconded by council member Rosenbaum um, City Clerk, you want to conduct the roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Anderl? Aye. Councilmember Reynolds? Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. Councilmember Jacobson? Aye. Councilmember Neese? Aye. Mayor Wong? Aye. And Council Member Rosenbaum. Aye. Great. Motion passes. Uh, the second motion that is before us um, is one involving the adoption of a proposed emergency ordinance. Uh, the adoption will require five votes to pass if the desire of the council is to make it effective immediately. So, do we have a motion to adopt ordinance number 20C 17? I so move. Uh, mayor as amended during oh i'm sorry thank you is there a motion to adopt ordinance numbers 20 c-17 as amended so moved. second all right we have uh i think council member Anderall has made the motion to adopt uh, ordinance number 20 c-17 as amended seconded by council member jacobson so uh city clerk please conduct the roll call Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Neese? Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. Council Member Anderl? Aye. Council Member Reynolds? Aye. Mayor Wong? Aye. Council Member Rosenbaum? Aye. And Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there wasn't much discussion about the issue of waiving the permit fee, but uh, I guess I will certainly entertain a motion to authorize the staff to waive the permit fee and utilize King County CARES Act funding to cover the cost. So moved. So moved. Okay, it's been moved by Council Member Neese and seconded by Council Member Anderall. Um, City Clerk, please conduct the roll call. Deputy Mayor Weicker. Aye. Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Council Member Reynolds? Aye. Mayor Wong? Aye. Council Member Anderl? Aye. Council Member Neese? Aye. And Council Member Rosenbaum? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so uh, this takes us to perhaps a 10 minute break. So uh, we'll come back and uh, continue on with our third item of regular business. So um, a 10 minute break. So uh, let's make it uh, 710. 710 will be back. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Sarah.
Mr. Mayor, we are live. We are live. Okay, great. Um, the uh, third item of regular business is Agenda Bill 5736, Town Center Moratorium Update and Findings of Fact. And uh, we welcome um, Deputy Director Allison Van Gorp of the Community Planning and Development Department and City Attorney Theo Park. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, allow me a moment to share my screen. Okay, are you able to see it now? Yes. Okay. Allison. Yeah, go ahead, Allison. All right, this will be a pretty brief presentation. Um, as you may remember, uh, the City Council adopted an ordinance on June 2nd, creating a moratorium on major new construction of the town center. And then we met again on July 21st, and the council held a public hearing um on the moratorium and after the public hearing the council recommended or directed staff to draft an ordinance amending the geographic extent of the moratorium um, and reducing the size um, so today we're bringing back that ordinance that would amend the the moratorium and it will also adopt additional findings of fact based on the public hearing and the council's discussion on july 21st so on my screen, you can see a map um, showing the geographic area that uh, we're talking about in this amended moratorium. It's the area south of Southeast 29th Street, east of 77th Avenue, west of 80th Avenue, and north of 32nd Street. Um, so that would include the businesses that are on the east side of 77th and the west side of 80th. Um, in addition, we have these findings of fact included in the ordinance, um, specifically noting that we did hold the public hearing and that the council finds that the retail sector is of utmost importance to maintaining and improving quality of life, as well as emergency preparedness by providing local access to goods and services on the island, um, and that we are changing the boundaries of the moratorium. Um, after the council takes action tonight, we are planning some ongoing steps to continue the work on looking at retail in the town center uh, while the moratorium is in place. Our staff is currently drafting an RFP for consultant support with the retail analysis, and we're planning to bring back a scope of work and schedule an appropriation request to council this fall related to that work. Um, and if the council does choose to move ahead with any amendments to the town center development regulations or the comprehensive plan, that would require planning commission review, a public hearing, and then adoption by the council. So the recommended actions for tonight are first to suspend the council rules of procedure requiring a second reading of the ordinance and then to adopt ordinance number 20-18 to amend the town center moratorium and adopt the additional findings of fact. So uh, that's all I have for my presentation. I'm gonna turn off the screen sharing and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rosenbaum. Thanks, um, I'm sure a lot of discussion around this. I just wanted to ask a process question here. We got a, a few emails today from folks um, kind of asking about the process here in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of the hearing uh, and public comment. Um, I wanna make sure obviously we're doing this kosher. Um, Bio, can you, can you talk to that a little bit? Uh, to make sure we're, we're all on the same page here. Absolutely. Um, you know, you you held your public hearing um, on the original moratorium um, last council meeting, and subsequent to that, you had the option of um, the code gives you the option of uh, either uh, you know um, leaving the moratorium as is or adopting a change in scope to the moratorium, and that's what you've 
directed uh, staff to prepare um, the, this ordinance with additional findings of fact. So um, that's presented to you um, tonight. And how about on the issue of um, waiving the second reading? The, the, the code, that's, that's not really a statutory um, requirement. That's a rules of procedure. So if, if that's at the pleasure of the city council. The code yeah. says that uh, the findings of facts and um, um, you know, additional findings of fact to support moratorium or any change um, will be adopted immediately, right? Um, I'm sorry, the, the findings of fact shall be adopted immediately following the, the public hearing. Um, as far as changing of change of scope, uh, the, the code is silent on that. So, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that it says immediately, um, you know, I would interpret that as the, the, at least the next um, council meeting, which is where we are today. Councilmember Anderall. Uh, Alicia, you're muted. Yeah, oh, thanks, Spence. And you and I were doing dueling unmutes, but, um, or Deb or somebody. But, um, yeah, no, I guess I, I thought I only had comments, but I guess I do have a question, and that concerns my. Um, issues about narrowing the scope of the moratorium from the last meeting where I was opposed to narrowing the scope to exclude the farmer's building. And um, because I feel like it, what what the council did and, and wanted to do was to step back and consider retail South 29. And by preemptorily excluding a large block that would have the potential for retail I, I think we're doing a disservice to the to the moratorium itself um, and also, you know, to the community from whom we have had little input. I, I, I take it that we had a legal public hearing, but I, I think we also need to take in the nuances associated with COVID and the difficulties that people are having, keeping abreast of issues and, and commenting. Um, so, so my question, though, specifically concerns farmers, and I don't know if it was specifically answered in the last meeting, but... My understanding is that they, the, the developer there wants to do a lot of interior and exterior changes to the existing shell structure and um, whether the moratorium would limit or prevent or hinder any of that initial development versus development in the current parking lot. Yeah, I don't believe what they're currently proposing for the existing building in terms of remodeling and upgrading that would be stopped by the moratorium because it's not, it would not trigger the major new construction threshold. It's considered a, you know, remodel or a minor change. So that can go forward. But if they would like to go forward with any additional new construction on the property um, with the original version of the moratorium, that would be prohibited with this new proposal, obviously they're, they're not included. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions or hands raised? I'm gonna, uh, I'll take a turn. So I guess this is addressed to um, city attorney and, and to the deputy um, director as well. So if we don't um, suspend and actually have a second reading the earliest that this might be back on the agenda is September 1. And in the meantime, I assume that the public will have an opportunity to share their views. Perhaps, again, it's not a public hearing, but we, there'll be opportunities for people to share their views. I assume that is the case. That's correct. It would not be part of the public hearing. It would, be not, it would not be part of the public hearing record, however. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Jacobson. Um, I was one of the proponents or maybe the moving party on this thing at uh, our last meeting. And I, the intent was not to do some special favor for farmers, the farmer's site necessarily which has never had any retail on it, or at least not since a bowling alley that predates most of us. 
um, than I. <laughs> and also to make make clear that the east side of 80th would also, which is largely, in fact, totally multi family, <clears throat> would also not be part of the focus of the moratorium since uh, neither of those areas currently uh, hold retail. Uh, that said, I, I, I think it would be advisable for us to uh, schedule this for a second reading. And because I think it's an important thing and I think the, uh, I, def I <clears throat> acknowledge the points made by the mayor and by Lisa Andrew that uh, the max amount of time uh, available for people to comment on this is probably well, uh, is probably merited. And so I'd be, I'd be inclined or I'd be happy to go along with uh, postponing the, or having a second reading and having that in September one. <clears throat> okay. Any other comments? Okay, so at this point, I guess I would uh, entertain a motion. You have it before you a recommend it, recommendation of staff. We have a motion to suspend council rules of procedure 6.3 and 10.1 requiring a second reading of the ordinance. So does anybody want to put forth that motion? All right, I don't see anybody wanting to put forth that motion, so that is going to die. Uh, City Clerk, I this has never occurred, and so I am assuming that, or City Attorney, uh, Mr. Park. So in light of the fact that the, the motion to waive second reading was not, was not passed, uh, right now, the option would be to uh, set this ordinance to for a second reading at the next council meeting. Thank you. So, is there a motion to set this ordinance? Sorry, <clears throat> set this uh, motion to a second reading at the next city council meeting. I so, so move. Second. Okay. So it's been moved by Council Member Jacobson and seconded, I believe, by Council Member Rosenbaum to move this um, matter to this to a second reading at the next city council meeting. City Clerk, please take the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Reynolds? Aye. Council Member Anderl? Aye. Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. Mayor Wong? Aye. Council Member Neese? Aye. And Council Member Rosenbaum. Aye. Thank you. Motion, uh, motion passes. Um, the fourth item of regular business is agenda bill 5735, the thrift store and recycling center remodel project update. Uh, before we begin the presentation, I just wanted to mention that in past meetings, Council Member Jacobson has mentioned uh, his past employment and involvement with Osborne Construction Company. For those who might be wondering, there is no connection between Osborne Construction Company and any of its affiliates uh, with Osborne Architects, Inc., with whom we're going to hear from shortly. Uh, also, as a reminder, there is uh, no recommended action tonight regarding this project. Uh, tonight, uh, council is being asked to discuss it and to provide feedback to the staff. Um, so. With that, I welcome Public Works Director Jason Kittner. Good evening, Council. For the record, Jason Kittner, your Public Works Director. Give me one second to pull up a very brief presentation for you tonight. Thumbs up that it's on the screen. Perfect, thank you. Uh, just real quickly this evening, uh, like I said, we have a very brief presentation, uh, seven slides. Uh, we'll quickly review the project scope. We'll introduce you to our design team, uh, talk about some of the existing conditions that they've discovered, and then ultimately have a council discussion about our next steps. So following the June 16th council meeting, uh, it was directed to staff to retain architectural engineering services to begin the preliminary assessment of the thrift shop and recycle center facilities. The overall goal was to maximize the retail floor space at the thrift shop. 
by doing that, it was to decommission the existing production spaces, also known as the donation processing areas at the thrift shop, relocate those production spaces and facilitate wholesale processing and sales, create a new office area and ADA accessible restrooms. Uh, hey, Jason, the following day, could I just interrupt? Could you go up to your screen and hit display settings? We've got, um, we've got your, yep, there you go. Try, try duplicate sideshow. And better. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, so following the June 16th council meeting, uh, literally the next day, the city got a request for qualifications out on the street. Uh, expressing the urgency and the abbreviated time frame for this project. I'm happy to report that we had eight qualified firms provide those statements of qualifications, and three of those firms were selected for interviews. Osborne Architects Incorporated, otherwise known as OAI, was selected as the preferred firm for the project, and they began the preliminary work uh, July 22nd, so just about two weeks ago. Since that time, uh, they've already completed three site visits and have begun review of the existing conditions, which they'll talk about here in just a second. Before I pass the baton to Jerry Osborne, uh, I just want to extend uh, our gratitude and sincere appreciation, sincere appreciation to Meg Lippert, Robin Russell, and Ira Appleman. Uh, the city did not possess uh, full as-builts uh, of the facilities, and as Meg mentioned tonight, Gareth reached out to her following public comment at the last council meeting and was able to acquire those as built. So our sincere thank you goes to uh, those three individuals who helped facilitate us getting those designs. Uh, and with that, Jerry, would you like to introduce you and Anise uh, and give a brief overview of your team before we go into existing conditions? Yeah, uh, just for the record, my name is Jerry Osborne and I, of course, would like to thank the selection committee uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'll just be brief uh, before I turn it over to Annie East. Uh, we just look forward to working with the city staff, the, the council members and thrift shop uh, uh, personnel and interested community members to come up with a successful uh, design solution um, for the uh, thrift shop and uh, recycling center. And uh, Annie East. Uh, hi, um, unfortunately my video is malfunctioning, but I'm hoping that you can at least hear me. Okay, good. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so it's been uh, two weeks, um, a lot of information uh, gathering. Um, we'll start with the recycling center. It's Overall footprint of the roof is approximately 1,600 square feet. Um, however, a good portion of that is um, covered outdoor space. The interior portion is 710 square feet, and that is part of the green, and you can't see my arrow, but one of the green rectangles right there. Thank you, Jason. Um, and the line weights aren't great, but there are a few column lines um, on the, uh, I guess that's the south and the west side. That kind of shows you the outer limit of the roof. And then of course, there's the existing park toilets that were added later at the bottom of the screen. Um, the basic design goal is to remain within the existing footprints of the facility and the existing asphalt that is already there um, to make sure that we don't um, encroach onto the park um, because we know it's a well-beloved park and uh, we want to be respectful of the community wishes. Um, the main structure of the building um, are the four walls that encompass that green area that's highlighted. Um, and those are concrete tilt up panels that were brought on site. Um, and the roof is basically laid on top and it's wood timber and the outer edge is uh, columns that, that hold the eaves. Um, so with these additional drawings that we received um, from Meg, thank you very much, um, we were able to have a better idea as to what these structural implications will be. Um, these are the main structure of the building, and so our main uh, concern with this is that any big modifications on those 
what we would call exterior walls or structural walls um, could be fairly complicated. Um, and the main point um, is to say that, you know, modifying or a, a big modification to an existing building like this is not necessarily more cost effective than uh, replacing the structure or new structure. Um, next slide, please. So Anise, this yeah. is, um, could you just go back because I, I don't want to leave that comment hanging out there. Um, Council, just to be clear, uh, Osborne Architect has uh, been on board with us for not even two weeks yet. Uh, we're still evaluating options here. Uh, we just want to be candid with you that uh, we have some more analysis to do on how this uh, building was constructed and, and, and what our options might be. So tonight we're not here ready with solutions. We do want to identify both the issues and the opportunities um, at this site. Um, go ahead, Anise. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and what I'll add is that we we did have the structural engineer come out last Thursday, um, and he is in process uh, to put a report together on both structures, actually, um, as both of them have um, a few structural um, issues or hurdles, I should say. Um, so the thrift store, um, you know, completely different animal, but also has structural um, issues this building was added on to probably three times um and so our concern with uh some of the interior walls here is that at one point or another a lot of these used to be exterior and or structural walls and so that is our main concern with the thrift store our structural engineer will be providing a report as to you know what we can open up and what is not you know, um, what is not easy to to move or, or change. And we are obviously waiting on that. And so this is just a few things. These are just a few things that we uh, want to look at um, when we are renovating this building. Um, so our focus, like I just said, is minimizing impacts to structure walls, uh, minimizing plumbing reconfigurations due to the building being a uh, concrete slab on grade, um, creating an ADA restroom, um, new office and improved retail floor layout. And I think the main goal should be stated is to increase the retail uh, layout for the facility. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at an offsite processing center right now. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. So council, as, as we've talked about, this has been a very abbreviated time frame uh, for the design work. And uh, although a OA OAI has hit this uh, hit the ground running, additional work is needed to still um, massage out different options for council consideration. Uh, more information is needed on the facilities and our goal is to come back to the council with uh, some options and costs for both facilities uh, in September. Um, part of that work will include uh, an updated engineer estimate for uh, the different um, options for council consideration. But uh, really, you know, this was just a quick update to tell you where we're at in the process. Um, it is it is moving forward, um, but it you know it took a little time to get a consultant on board. Uh, get them up to speed, um, and then uh, really start diving into what options and opportunities of both sites uh, are available to us in the future. And with that, that concludes our presentation for tonight, and we'll open up to council level discussion. Benson, you're on mute. I'm on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I rarely so, get to say that. I rarely okay, get to say that. All right. That. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was actually saying, uh, Councilmember Rosenbaum, you have the first question. Thanks. I it's a little bit tough to ask a ton of questions here, but one of the questions that I'm, that I'm curious about is for the design 
of the recycling center, are we looking at options that include restrooms there to continue that? Um, or is that a question we should wait until September to, to, to have? Um, Council Member, I think that's, it's a, it's a valid question. Um, I think, I think it's too early in the stage of the design to answer that clearly at this point in time. I think that's, you know, getting from a park use standpoint, moving the restrooms out uh, to a more centralized location that's more accessible and not sort of off the beaten path, uh, it would be advantageous to the park, but we're not there yet. So I think it's something that we would uh, consider if and when that comes up for conversation. Um, it would be appealing if that, if that would be a possibility, but we just, we don't know at this point in time. So something to sort of just set off to the side and consider as the design takes us there, if it takes okay, us there. So, so, I mean, I, I guess my question is in September, we're going to be seeing options that include that, or is that, are we just not even there yet for a decision to include that? In any I, don't, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we know that answer yet. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Council member niece. I, you know, I wanted to ask Anais the, if she could comment on some of the public testimony earlier. She may have not have heard it, but there was some uh, testimony that it called the expansion of the thrift shop. Is there any expansion of the thrift shop, or is this? How would you characterize this project? Uh, I think at the moment we're not saying we're expanding anything as potentially reorganizing spaces. Um, and, and we are actively looking at options that will work for the thrift store, the community, um, and, and, and people who are interested in, in how this impacts the park. But um, I, I don't know what the comment was on the expansion uh, specifically. Just that there was, that this was being characterized as an expansion, but maybe just to be clear, you're not, you're not looking at moving any exterior walls or increasing the gross floor area of the total building, are you? Of the thrift store specifically? Correct. Yes, that's correct. You are not doing those things. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Jacobson. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Aeneas and uh, also Gareth uh, Rees from CPD uh, who met with Salim and me on Monday out there and we got a chance to exchange thoughts and uh, acquaint them with where, where our thinking was and vice versa. And uh, as, as a contractor, of course, I'm, I, I like to go fast or faster, but I, I would commend uh, the architects for taking a good measured approach to this. And they're clearly with old buildings, you look at structural stuff because that uh, implicates human safety and that's what they're they're doing, and until such time as a structural report gets done and analyzed, uh, you know, we, we really don't know what our options are going are looking like, either from the perspective of what we can do or what it might cost. But uh, thanks, Anas, for your help, and Gareth, if you're on tonight, if you're not, you'll have to watch the, the uh, video, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember uh, Reynolds. Yeah, two related questions. One is when we talked about this in, in mid June, I believe, I, I think it was stated that we viewed this as a four month project from, from that mid June date forward. We're now about six weeks in, it feels like we're kind of just getting started. Do we, to what extent do we still believe that four month time frame is practical? Um, I'll jump uh, in here. Uh, we're gonna need more time. And I, I think one of the reasons that we were pushing hard um, a month ago, is we were optimistic about getting the thrift shop reopening, you know, for a, I'll call it a semi-normal um, holiday shopping season. Um, I'm less optimistic now that getting the thrift shop open before the end of the year is going to produce um, high revenue given our, our COVID impacts. And so my advice to you city council is give yourself um, permission to slow it down a little bit. We were working on a very accelerated track. Um, so we're probably looking at the end of the year right now based on just my guess. Uh, but when we check back in with you in September, one of the things we'll ask our consultants to talk about is what the schedule would look like. Um, I do think the bidding climate is still very favorable 
for us uh, to do capital projects now in this climate. There are construction companies eager for the work. Um, we just have a little more work to do, and I think it's important for us to get uh, good analysis to you, and our consultants just haven't had the time yet. Okay, well, I, I, I agree with your direction. I think we, I think it's also wise to plan for being open or continuing through December, and it's, it's nice that we're planning for that to do it right. Um, the, the second and related question is, while it wasn't stated, I'm reading between the lines, and I think what I'm hearing the unstated message to be is, more complicated than we thought and might be more expensive than we thought it's because of the issues with uh, moving the walls in the recycle center or, or starting over with more structural walls that we thought weren't structural in the, in the thrift store recognizing that nobody knows enough to commit to anything at this point is that kind of should i interpret this as a warning that, that might be the case oh, i would say if, you know possibly remember that in in project management uh, everything is iterative, so we've had the benefit of getting uh, structural engineers out on both sites now. We've learned some things we didn't know um, six weeks ago, uh, so that has been really helpful. We have uh, design, we have plan sets actually for the thrift shop uh, that we didn't have thanks to um, some citizens. Uh, so look, I've been doing project management for a long time. There are solutions. I need to give uh, the architects a chance to look at uh, the structural components of both of these facilities and present us with some options. Um, so yes, uh, there might be some challenges we didn't foresee, totally normal. Uh, I need to get back to you with solutions and that's what I don't have this evening ready just yet. Uh, okay, then t I totally understand. I'm not saying you should have solutions. I just yeah. wanna make sure I'm reading the tea leaves at least that there's a possibility of that. It sounds like yes, but we don't. Yeah, Council Member, and that's understandable. You don't know yet. Yeah, I would also just add, like, with as Jesse said, with, with every project, there's always a nuance. There's always a complication, an unforeseen complication that comes up. Um, that's part of that's part of the that's part of this process, right? Um, to uncover those and then work to find solutions. And so we need the time to do that. Um, they've got a good start in place, but we need to, we need some more time to work through the different nuances of the projects. And it sounds like you've got the time. I'm, I'm confident you'll do the, the right work to figure it out. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Anderall. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so, first, thank you to Osborne and Jason and, and Salim and Jake for jumping in and, and like really accelerating this process. It's, I've been working with an architect on a personal project and I'm like, I wish I had the timeline you guys had, but. Um, the, the questions that I have are around, so the bathrooms that are there now, whether they would be able to be moved or would be required to be in a remodeled space if we were taking donations there and had staff there. And then secondarily, um, whether the recycle center could be respected, but rebuilt for less money than it would cost to remodel it. And, and I think that from what I read in the presentation, that's kind of still potentially being looked at, but I would just like um, Aeneas's thoughts or, or others' thoughts on that. Let me, let me jump in real quick on the restrooms. Uh, when we be first talked about this project, it was intended to be um, a streamlined project. <laughs> and the assumption was that the existing park restrooms uh, would remain and could possibly be used uh, by recycling center staff um, and, and people dropping off donations. So they would serve a dual purpose. Um, at this point, uh, that's still the assumption. Uh, we'll let, okay. our, let our architects dive into that a little bit more. I think one of the things that we have to look at because this facility supports a park, uh, we have to look at things like pedestrian safety, um, how your your park users are going to cross uh, the driveway, things like that. So we need to, we need to dive in um, to those details. Um, as for, is it uh, more cost effective to rebuild on this site? That's a question that we still need to answer. Uh, you heard a moment ago, and I'll let uh, Jerry or Anise dive in here, that uh, we do have structural walls at the recycling center that we need to take a look at. Does it make sense uh, to, to retain that roof line and what can we do with those walls or is there a, a different option? And I'm hesitant um, right now to, to say we're going one direction or the other. I think we'll need to give our team time to study this and come back to you so that you understand 
uh, your cost options and, and the, the full scope of what we're dealing with. Okay, thanks, Jesse. That's great. I mean, I just wanted to raise the issues. I didn't expect definitive answers. Yeah. yeah. I, I can give a definitive answer to one of your questions, and, and there, there is no code imperative that would require separate restrooms for the recycling center. They're in proximity uh, with signage. Uh, they, uh, users of the recycling center could use those toilet rooms. So it would be a choice, uh, not a mandate uh, for new toilet facilities. Thank and, you. And that's all I would offer there. Um, Council Member Nice. Uh, you know, I just wanted to remind everyone that one of the tailwinds that the renovation of the of the former recycle center had was that the existing use would be consistent with the prior use. And so that wasn't going to invoke a lot of code changes. So parking requirements were going to stay the same, bathroom requirements were going to stay the same. So largely that was providing some significant benefit. I think that's not, that's not a decision point for tonight, but as we look at structural engineering and the cost of renovating that facility and rehabbing it versus potentially some other uh, type of approach, those would be uh, considerations as well. I just have a couple of questions and maybe that'll probably close this uh, presentation, I guess. Jesse, do we have an idea? I mean, we've talked in terms of 30, uh, September. I mean, are we talking in terms of the first meeting of September or second meeting of September when we might see the 30% design? Uh, that's a specific question. And then I just want to echo, I think, uh, Council Member Reynolds. I, I think I, I certainly applaud uh, the approach of we want to do it right. This is a major capital project. And so mm -hmm. I, I certainly want you to take uh, the time, you and the other uh, professional team members, mm -hmm. take the time necessary uh, to do it right. So okay. sure. in terms of the 30% design, which I know that we thought we might have today, when do we think we might get that? Yeah. Um, you probably noted, Mayor Wong, as you were asking, is it going to be September 1st or 15th, that several of us were smiling. Uh, haven't made a commitment yet. Um, I'm mindful that you have a very, very full calendar this fall. Um, so Jason and Gareth Reese, who's um, in the background tonight, uh, we'll be working with our architects over the next two to three weeks and measuring progress. If we need a little extra time, I may push it to September 15th so that we're not um, you know, we're coming to you with hopefully 30% uh, design and uh, really uh, comprehensive information so we don't have to come back for a second meeting. And that would be the time that I would ask you to evaluate um, the support for this project to go further. Um, I okay. will also note that one of the arc things architects will be looking at is um, phasing. Uh, so we've talked about um, it looks like right now a, a lot more work may be required at the recycling center. That that could change with further study. So there is a scenario, for example, where we start work on the recycling center, uh, the thrift shop may reopen in a limited capacity. Um, while the recycling center works being done, uh, then you transition processing for a while. Um, anyway, in the construction world, uh, as you know, there's lots of ways that we can put this together. So that's something we'll be asking Osborne to evaluate. In the event, um, as we get closer to the end of the year, uh, there is an opportunity to, to open on a more limited capacity. So I think I've said this before, we have operations components, we have construction phasing components, and then we certainly have a whole bunch of design work to do between now and September. Right, thank you. And I, I guess, um, since you mentioned operations, I assume uh, staff is being, uh, folks who work at the thrift shop, thrift store, are being consulted, or at least um, just, there's discussions between them and Osborne. Yes, that's correct. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of time together, though, so that's another reason that we need to take August um, to really drill down on operations. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see anybody else's hands are up, so I think uh, we've given some direction, some questions, but I think uh, that's where we are right now, and I look forward to getting uh, additional information sometime in the month of September, if possible. So, thank you. Um, with, with that, thank you very much uh, to the Osborne team. Thank you. Um, and I think with that, we are moving to our final item of regular business, Agenda Bill 5738, Anti-Racism and Cultural Awareness Training and Listening Sessions Update. Again, there's no recommended action uh, for tonight by the council. 
Uh, we're only spending the time right now to discuss and to provide feedback to staff. Uh, and to lead us in this discussion right now will be Chief Administration, Alex. Good evening, Council. Um, I have a PowerPoint here to share with you. So just one second. Are you able to see my PowerPoint? Yes. All right. And I'll see if I can make it work correctly. Okay. Okay, so uh, tonight I'm here to talk with you and just give you an update on, um, uh oh, oh, that's not good. Huh, let's try this again, I apologize. I'm not sure what happened. There, okay. Um, so I'm here tonight to give you an update on um, a motion that the council made um, on June 16th, which was to, uh-oh, I cannot scroll through. Hmm, here we go. Okay, so uh, on June 16th, the city council uh, provided direction to staff uh, to uh, appropriate funds for annual training in diversity and implicit bias, cultural awareness, and related topics for the city council and boards and commission members. And also um, authorized uh, to appropriate funds for engaging a consultant to conduct a series of listening sessions. Uh, to hear firsthand stories of minority experiences on the island. So um, what I have done, uh, staff has reached out, I've reached out to several trainers um, to schedule um, these trainings for the city council and boards and commissions. However, most were fully booked for June and July. So I'll continue to contact <coughs> trainers um, and schedule trainings in the fall. Uh, the recommendations that we have for these trainings would be to hold them virtually uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. We also suggest limiting the capacity for each training to create a space where people feel comfortable sharing. Um, so I'm imagining three to four trainings with 15 to 20 people each, which would be a mix of council members and boards and commission members in each one. Listening sessions, uh, we will contract with a consultant that will moderate listening sessions with the public and the city council. So per the council's direction, um, African-American and black and indigenous and people of color, BIPOC would be invited to share their firsthand accounts of their experiences on Mercer Island. These sessions could be expanded or additional sessions could be scheduled to allow all residents to speak. The recommendations for these listening sessions um, is to schedule two to three listening sessions and then more if are needed or desired. We would again hold these sessions virtually via the Zoom platform due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we suggest requiring pre-registration to speak, set, setting a speaking limit uh, time, and then also accepting any statements in advance by email or US mail. <laughs> We also uh, suggest maybe determining and grouping speakers by topic. Uh, these are some of the suggested topics that we could uh, group together. Uh, that way the council has an opportunity to respond to each topic if uh, interested. Another recommendation um, from staff is that we develop a goal statement for the listening sessions to allow the community to um, understand why we're doing these sessions and what we hope to gain from the session. So I have drafted a statement and um, uh, council members, uh, uh, we had a suggestion from Mayor Wong and then council member Nice. And so I'm going to skip to that slide, which shows some of the differences. Um, instead of specifically hearing from um, BIPOCs or minorities, we are, um, our council is suggesting broadening it to be more inclusive for all residents. So at this point, I can turn it back over to the council and um, you can ask questions and let me know um, which, uh, what you'd like the goal statement to be. We need that back up, don't we? 
Council Member Andrew. Hi, um, thanks Ali for your presentation and thanks for diligently trying to find trainers. I, I understand in the current environment that, that they are booked out. Um, could you remind me what you said about when the first available sessions might be and then um, and then I have a follow up. Sure, are you talking about the trainings or the listening sessions? Oh, well, are the, tr are the listening sessions gonna be moderated by a trainer? So They'll be moderated by a consultant, yeah. Okay, so kind of the same thing, or, or both. So our goal is to have the trainings occur in the fall. So that would be an actual trainer that we would hire, hire to do the trainings for the city council members and the boards and commission members. And then we would also have the listening sessions in the fall. And those would be um, you know, Zoom meetings with all of the council and uh, people coming on to say, um, you know, to, to speak about their experiences on the island. Okay. And I don't have, we don't have anything scheduled at the moment. We've struggled to actually find somebody that can commit to doing this. Okay. Well, and then, okay, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd be interested to hear what other council members have to say, but I, I did like council member niece's um, recommendations for a, a more inclusive um, goal statement to hear from all people on the island as opposed to, you know, calling out particular groups. I mean, I think everybody may have stories and I, I don't I don't think it's right to exclude anybody. Okay, uh, council member uh, Reynolds. Yeah, um, thank you, Allie. I, I think uh, you did a great job with this. I'm, I'm very pleased with the direction that's heading. A, a couple of comments that are, are not in any way contradicting anything you've done, but just to kind of mind, move forward on this. One is that I hope when we have these listening sessions that we find some way to reach out to people that don't live on the island, either people that are visitors on the island or people that used to live here and left. Um, I, I think that would be, and to the extent that there are examples of people, and I've heard secondhand that there are people who have left because they felt unwelcome here. I think, I think it's very important to, to learn from people about that. Uh, but the second thing I wanna make sure that we address is uh, in, in your, I guess it was your topics list. Uh, I don't recall exactly what the four topics were. They were very good. But what I see on there would be kind of uh, uh, exploring social slash community asp uh, opinions and actions about race separate and distinct from what the city attitudes and actions are towards race. And I think that's important to know as well. So for example, if it were true, and I have no idea that it is, but if it were true that people felt unwelcome at joining one of our island uh, social or community clubs, or if they felt unwelcome at island businesses, uh, these would be important things to know. And I want to make sure that whenever we talk about this, that, that that's on the agenda as well. Yeah, uh, the second bullet was systematic racism beyond policing and racial justice. So I, I think that's a little bit closer to what you're asking about. But. Yeah, and, and I had interpreted that, and maybe I'm wrong, but it's systematic racism by the city government separate from the police force. And I'm saying if there are other things going on elsewhere in the community, and, and if you think it includes what I'm suggesting, great, just so we don't forget about it one way or another. Yeah, and we can refine these categories. These were just suggestions, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I, I think in general, it's clear you put a lot of thought into this, and I, and I think I, I really like the track that we're on, um, and we just need to make sure that, you know, we strike while the iron is hot and are hopefully able to bring somebody in relatively soon to get this to happen. And I'm sure you're on top of that. So thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, Council member Jacobson. Uh, <clears throat> Ali, uh, I commend you for the work you've done here. Trying to, you know, find something that some people will agree with. It's like trying to lo level a multi-legged table. That's why I admire. I do feel that we have not cast our net widely enough. I don't think this should be limited to racial discrimination. I think there are all kinds of discrimination, sex discrimination, age discrimination, religious discrimination, uh, and probably one or two things that I haven't thought of. And if we really want a clean house here, I think we ought to look at all those things. And while uh, the current uh, uh, focus is by some people and some things is on racial discrimination, there are, there are a lot of other things. If you talk to some of the older people on the island, you'll hear an earful about some of the stuff. Uh, I know there's religious discrimination. But we, you know, we're well aware that there's anti-Semitism stuff, which is uh, any form of discrimination is just as pernicious as the other, in my mind. And so I think we ought to cast our net wider and 
by if we do it narrowly, then we don't value uh, dealing with those other forms of discrimination. I think that's a serious mistake. I'm going to take a turn here. And Ali, if you can bring back that screen and, and Councilmember Nice, maybe you can help me. I think there was some words that were left out. Um, if you could go back, Ali, and do the, uh, the redlined version. Sure. Yeah, it's like in the first paragraph, um, and again, uh, Councilmember Nice. Go back to the original, or do no, I no, no. Go, go, go to the red line. Go to the red line. So in the first paragraph, you know, who have experienced. Um, I had notes that have, um, according to the primary goal of the listening sessions, is to allow the Mercer Island City Council and the community to hear firsthand accounts of racism in our community. That's what I thought uh, Councilmember Nice had amended. That's the language that I thought he had amended, um, which I agree with, which, you know, which I'm fine with. But um, I guess to uh, Councilmember Jacobson's uh, comment, I think it's important to focus on racism, number one. And number two, th that's why I that other, um, we have this other paragraph in terms of, which is broader, basically, is to learn from other members, all members of our community on how to make Mercer Island a more welcoming and inclusive community for all people. So I think that captures your concerns raised about other potential forms of discrimination. But I think in light of uh, what is going on, I think it uh, is important to actually focus on racism. That's, again, I thought that was our primary goal, but I think it's also important to have a wider and more expansive goal as well. So anyway, uh, Councilmember Ruiz, is that, um, is what we see there, is that correct? Or did I misread your email to me? No, I'm, uh, you know, the edit that I had looks like it's reflected in the middle and then your edit is reflected uh, oh. after that. Well, that may, be, that may be the wrong, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. I'm sorry, you were absolutely right. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to read because of the red and the black, but I think that if you yeah. uh, put it all together, this is the language. Yeah, okay, okay. No, I, thank you very much for pointing that out. I got to get my- There you go. That makes it a little oh. easier right there. Sorry, I, I wanted to show you the changes, but that didn't yeah. work very well. So. No, that's fine. Anyway, so I, I think that second paragraph captures the language that uh, Council Member Peace and I had uh, you know, edited or, or, or reworked. And that next paragraph is one that's more expansive, so. And and maybe to Jake's point, Ali, you could provide some commentary. Is it is it the same resource that would address all the other isms in addition to racism? Like, could you consolidate all these things or are you looking specifically for, for a resource that can address this bullet point? Uh, well, so I'm taking my direction from you, uh, going off the original motion, which seems to be more closely aligned with um, racism, race, diversity, and inclusion. So if the council wants to expand it to other things, that's fine. Um, I think that we, uh, I, I, it's a different kind of uh, consultant or trainer I would be finding then. Um, Mostly all of this is going to stem, I think it's going to be racism focused and then it can be applied to other isms. Um, but it, if the council wants that, we'll, we'll find someone that can, can kind of apply it to all those. Thanks, Ellen. Mm -hmm. uh, council member, I'm sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker. Uh, yeah, so Allie, thank you so much for your great work on this. I look forward to the trainings in the fall for the elected officials and boards and commission members. Um, I think that'll be useful. And for these listening sessions, I um, I think this all came out of the Black Lives Matter work um, that came out of the George Floyd experience and the march that we had on Mercer Island in June. So I think this work is really important and important to be focused, especially given all the public input we've been getting for the last two months on this really critical issue. So I look forward to finding the consultant 
having these listening sessions, learning from our community, and more importantly, figuring out what to do next. I appreciate the public comment we had tonight from Carrie Wernick about already giving us a suggestion for a DEI committee, right? So as we start collecting good ideas and potential action items, I'm looking forward to figuring out um, what we can learn and then what we can do. So thank you for starting the process. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Jacobson. Uh, <clears throat> your suggestion, Mayor, does not address at all what I had to say. And uh, stylistically, if you start with something narrow, you, everything else is read from the narrow focus. But be that as it may, I don't agree with you. Okay. Uh, Councilmember uh, Rosenbaum. Thanks. You know, I, I think on this, you know, I think what our original intention here was to identify what we don't know. Um, you know, and I, I think as a, a two things, I think that's one of them. And then I think the second piece here is around these trainings. Um, I've, I've been in a few of these trainings and, and I don't think that they do as obviously I don't know who Ali has spoken with, but you know, they don't tend to limit to one thing. Um, I think especially around issues of implicit and explicit bias, um, you start to learn really quickly things. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, it will be pretty wide ranging. I, and I think, to, you know, to your point, I, I do think that the, the language here um, is not limiting. And I, I hope that people that have experienced other forms of discrimination will, will come forward and talk about that, um, you know, at, at those listening sessions. And I think from there, we'll sort of learn what our next steps are. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Anderle, your hand is still up. Is that? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty hypocritical of the council to say that we want to um, promote diversity and inclusion and limit our discussions to just one kind of issue, which is racial discrimination. There is gender discrimination. There is LGBT discrimination. There is age discrimination. There is religious persecution. Those are all... Um, I, I don't know why you would elevate one over the other and limit our discussions to issues of racial discrimination. I think the first paragraph in the goal statement is too narrow. I think the second paragraph uh, would be great if we replaced the word racism with discrimination. I think the third paragraph is great. And um, I think the fourth paragraph you know, should also uh, be broadened to include council actions and policies around diversity and inclusion, including race, racism, and you know other types of discrimination, including age discrimination, gender discrimination, LGBTQ discrimination. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's extremely hypocritical to say we are gonna consider diversity and inclusion, but we're only gonna consider it for one group. So um, it, we're gonna do this training, we're gonna do this work, we're going to spend this money, Let's do it right. Let's hit every issue. It doesn't minimize the discussions about racism. It just says that there are other groups who are equally worthy of having their issues addressed. Uh, Councilman, uh, Councilmember Rosenbaum. Sorry, I forgot to take my hand down before. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker. Yeah, um, Lisa and Jake, I agree with you. Um, gender discrimination, age discrimination, alive and well. I don't think we can boil the ocean at this point in time with our limited resources and budget. So I'd like to start with this, this attempt to try to figure out how to address racism in our community and, and be a more welcoming, diverse community starting here and building from here. So I, I don't think it's hypocritical. I think it's a place we can start at a moment in time when we and the rest of our community and region and country are looking at this. So I can't wait to get started here and then expand because yeah, I'm painfully aware there's gender discrimination and age discrimination. But right now, right here with the summer we've had and the spring that we've had, I'd love to, to start this conversation with race. So I would appreciate us moving forward with, with this great goal statement and start with the work that Ali has already begun to lay out in the middle of everything else the city has to deal with at this difficult moment in time. I think it's important to carry this work forward and start here. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Reynolds. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit here on this issue of scope. Um, 
uh, on the one hand, uh, I'll just note that focusing, focusing on racism, it's, it's not just looking at one group. There are many races and many groups that have, have a stake in this. Um, but the second thing I would note is, is that you know, to, to Councilmember Weicker's comment, I, I agree that Aaron is kind of hot on this. Uh, Councilmember Reynolds, we're losing your audio. Could you lean in a, a bit? Sorry, I was I was relying on the uh, the space bar trick, and maybe my finger was not holding well enough. I'll do it the other way. Okay, uh, we, we still don't have you, so so keep talking. <laughs> I think you've got to get closer. Okay, I'm I'm right next to my computer. I'm not sure what more I can do. Are you hearing? Me yeah, now? yeah, that's better. Okay. It's rare in my life that I've been accused of being too quiet, but I'll, <laughs> I'll run with it. Um, I, I was just saying that I'm, I'm a little torn here because I, I believe that the, the race that you really affects many, many people, and it's more than just one group. It's a broad issue. It's a timely issue. It's an issue that, for understandable reasons, is, is on the top of the agenda everywhere. And I, I, I think it's appropriate to have most of the focus on that. Um, that said, I, I readily acknowledge there are many problems elsewhere with, with uh, gender, age, uh, religious, uh, disability status, uh, the sexual orientation, discrimination, and it's important to talk about those things as well. I'm not absolutely convinced now is the time for those, but they do need to be talked about. And I also recognize we've had a history of anti-Semitic incidents here on the island. So in some sense, uh, religious discrimination in particular is, is a timely topic here, even though it may not have come to the top of the agenda elsewhere in the country. So I, I, I think focusing on race here is important, but perhaps a slightly stronger acknowledgement that other things need to be on the agenda as well would be helpful. So for example, maybe in the first line, we say address racial discrimination, we can just change it to say racial and other discrimination to make it clear that racial is the focus, but other things will be on the table too, might be a reasonable compromise. I'm sorry, Craig, where, where are you making that change? Or is uh, change? The, the, the oh. end of the first line where it says racial, yeah, with the, the way Ali just wrote it. Okay. I assume that was Ali, I don't know. <laughs> that, that would seem to me to be uh, kind of a, a, a reasonable compromise solution. Uh, let's see, uh, council member, uh, Admiral. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I thank you, Craig. I, I agree with that. Um, I, like I said, I, I do think it's discriminatory <laughs> to address discrimination for only one group. So it's like I said, I, I, I will go with the strong word hypocritical. If you want to narrow this discussion, um, I, I like Craig's edit to the first paragraph. Um, I would. I would take um, that edit further into the second paragraph um, and say, if you want to leave racism in there or um, other discrimination, um, <laughs> Ali, I, my heart goes out to you editing on the fly. Um, you know, I thought that I wouldn't have to do this anymore when I, wasn't city clerk, but somehow you guys just bring me right back into wordsmithing at the meeting. Somehow, um, yeah, I would say, I would put the word other in front of discrimination, but um, you know, so I, like I said, I, I just, I feel really strongly that all of these issues need to be addressed. I, I don't think that, I mean, just, I don't, and I don't wanna minimize the, the issues around race because things are at a boiling point and you do need to deal with it, but I, I don't, think that it's necessarily required for the city to um, prioritize things that are at a boiling point just because they're at a boiling point. We need to prioritize things that are important and all other types of discrimination, including racism, are important for us to deal with. That's it, putting my hand down. Thank you very much for considering my comments. Thank you. Allie, you're missing a, you're missing a of the, that's in the original form in front of listening. So accordingly, a primary goal of the. Okay. There you go. Okay, uh, Councilman Morales, you still have your hand up. Do you have another comment? Nope, I'll take it down. Okay. So uh, good discussion. Um, I, I still personally believe it's important to 
uh, focus on racism, um, but on the, you know, again, it doesn't mean that there aren't other forms of discrimination. Absolutely there are, uh, but given where we are right now, I think it is, it is important to at least have an intentional discussion about racism. And I think, I can't remember who it was, I, uh, maybe it was uh, Councilman Rosenbaum. I think the discussion is gonna bleed over into all different types of dis uh, discrimination, which is really a good thing for this community. So uh, it'll, hopefully this will be, this listening session will provide an opportunity for people to have frank uh, conversations. So um, I think all we were trying to do, uh, again, no specific recommendation is being asked of us other than perhaps maybe kind of a thumbs up on whether or not, you know, the, the goal statement that we just saw is something that uh, we can go forward with. Um, you, I don't know, uh, Ali, I know you didn't want any, there, I know that the agenda bill says no recommended action, but so um, this is great to have you all uh, give the input on the goal statement. Um, I'm happy to either move forward with this being the statement or bring it back at another time so you can finalize it. Um, and then just so you know what staff's next steps will be is we'll secure the consultants for the trainings and the listening sessions moderator. Then we'll get all the training scheduled with city council members and boards and commission members. And then we'll schedule and widely publicize the listening sessions. So there's not much that we need you to do um, at this point. Okay. Is there gonna be a time where we formally adopt the goal statement or? Um, that's up to you. I'm happy to bring it back at some point um, and have you do that. Um, Councilman Reynolds, you have not, your... Yeah, it's not necessary for you to make a motion to adopt it unless you would like to memorialize it that way. Councilmember Reynolds, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I, I do think it would be helpful to memorialize this. If not tonight, then perhaps at the September meeting to be a record for this. So I, I would encourage that. I also wanted to, Ali, if you could go to the next slide for just a second. Um, I, I heard back from some members of the community comments to the effect of why do we need to hire a consultant for this? And and I just want, and, and I, I think you would agree with me, but I want to be strongly on record that I think it's very, very important to go outside for this to make sure that we have both the right skill sets and the right knowledge to do it, both the both the facilitating and the training. And secondly, so that we have uh, a, a, an objective person without skin in the game that's, that's in here to talk about these issues with us. Yeah, so my goal um, is that the, the, people, the people that we hire, this is what they do professionally. So they have the answers to the questions. They understand how to moderate listening sessions and they also know the topics very well. Um, we do not have anybody on staff that can do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think a, a discussion like this has the potential to be a highly emotional discussion and having people that know how to keep a discussion like that on track on a topic like this is, is critical for its success. Well, and in order for this to be a truly, truly to be a listening session, for council and for staff and the community, you have to have somebody that's moderated. You can actually listen. So you're not worrying yes. about the logistics and what's happening. Okay, okay. can we, uh, Allie, can you stop screen sharing here? And then, I absolutely can. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, the decision, we can either discuss a motion to adopt the goal statement as edited tonight, or we can, again, maybe move it over to the next I don't, Alan, when is this coming back to us, do you think, in the, for another update, or do we talk in September? Yeah, I, I, probably the second September meeting, I would imagine. Um, okay. August is a tough month to get a hold of people, sure. so, yeah. Or we can... Uh, so, Mayor, can I make a, can I make a motion? Uh, Council Member Nice. Can, uh, so, I, can I make a motion to... Yes, adapt? you may. Yes, you can I would, go ahead. If I would you want like to make, to make a, motion. a motion to adopt the language as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved by Councilmember Nice and seconded by Deputy Mayor Weicker to adopt the goal statement as amended. Uh, City Clerk. Um, uh, can we have some discussion? I'm sorry, absolutely. Uh, I, my apologies. 
Yes. No, no, no problem. I, yeah. It was easy. It was easier to just say that than to raise my hand. Um, <laughs> I would encourage us, I think, to bring it back for um, another discussion on the goals statement because I don't think the, the again the public has not had a lot of opportunity to weigh into this. Um, Salim, I, I respect your motion and and I'm you know generally willing to support it, but and maybe it'll be adopted in its exact form. Um, but I, I'm just always kind of leaning toward um, additional public input. What what does the community want us to do here? And I, I don't know that we've had a lot of chance to hear about that. This was not an agenda item that was in, contemplated to have a motion associated with it. So um, I, I worry about that lack of transparency for the for the public. Uh, Council Member Jacobson. Uh, the uh, summary also provides that we have to appropriate funds and authorize funds for consultants and all this sort of stuff, none of which we have a basis for doing at this point in time. So this is coming back no matter what. I, I think it would be better if it came, uh, we did it all of one piece. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other council, Deputy Mayor Weicker. Um, I'll just say, if we're going to ask Allie to look into consultants, then costs for doing this work, it might help to have this goal statement as clear as it is so that we can queue up whatever the cost might be and whatever the discussions might be and what we're hoping to get out of it. So um, we did this agenda bill back in June. This is just clarifying that. And I think we can get more details in September when Allie brings it back. So I'm in support of narrowing, nailing down this language tonight and then getting more details in September once Allie has an update for us. Okay. Any other questions at this point? I agree with that. Okay, well, uh, Council Member Nice, your hand is up. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the reason I wanted to have the motion is that we have a long break between now and September, and we have all contributed tonight to this statement. There's nobody's opinion that was expressed tonight that I don't think, you know, I think we incorporated everybody's uh, thoughts into the statement. If we're going to uh, be re reactive to the, the events, uh, recent events, then I think since we all participated, nobody seems to object to the final language that we should adopt it as what we're moving forward with. I, I had been pretty strongly against telling the community what we're going to do for them, but the council supported a lot of actions that were council driven. And if we're gonna do it that way, we might as well just do it that way. And the quickest way to hear from the community is to put forth a statement, generally scoping what we'd like to discuss and hear those stories. And I think it's important that if this is the process and we've all contributed, that we just keep moving forward. Putting the brakes on it for a month, to me, doesn't make much sense. Thank you, Council Member Nice. Um, no other questions. Uh, we have a motion on the table and it's been seconded. City Clerk, do you want to call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Wong. Oh, I. Council Member Rosenbaum. Aye. Council Member Jacobson. Abstain. Council Member Nice. Aye. Council Member Anderall. Aye. Council Member Reynolds. Aye. And Deputy Mayor Weicker. Aye. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Um, so now we move on to uh, other businesses and the planning schedule. And for that uh, discussion, uh, City Manager Jesse Bond. Uh, good evening again, Council. I'll be brief as I know we uh, have an executive session still this evening. Uh, I just want to call out again the August 18th City Council meeting is canceled. Uh, I hope that gives everyone uh, some time to enjoy a staycation at home. <laughs> um, also wanted to call out, and we mentioned this last time, that we have added a special meeting on October 13th. And the goal there is to do uh, back-to-back -back weeks on the budget, so the 13th and the 20th. Um, 
And then we've uh, gone ahead and published our uh, calendar out through the end of the year based on items that we know about. Most of your fall schedule will be dedicated to budget discussions um, and we'll be um, adding additional items as they come up. So that's my update on the planning schedule. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any upcoming council member absences to report? Oh, uh, Council Member Jacobson. Yes, I have a question on September 15th. Uh, we have the uh, G. Richard Hill Code Amendment, which is the, you know, the uh, JCC thing. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that, the priority of dealing with that at that point in time isn't quite a lot less than budgeting and a number of the other things that we have to, to deal with. Well, I, I, I don't know why it's why it's there. It seems to me that could be put at the end of the year and dealt with in the fullness of time. <clears throat> um, I'm I'm not prepared to address uh, scheduling and timing, but I'd be happy to get back to you on uh, on that. Thank you, mm -hmm. okay. uh, Councilmember Andrew. Yes, and I'm sorry, I don't have the planning schedule in front of me. But are we planning to have a meeting on election night? Uh, it's currently scheduled that way. You have a couple of options. Uh, we can reschedule it. Uh, we can set our agenda such that we conclude our work by 8 o'clock p.m. Um, it's your pleasure. It's it's on my radar to uh, revisit as we get closer to the date. We're I'm happy to work with you on doing that now. Okay. Well, maybe further discussion. I want other council members to think about it, but I. I did. Um, I did mention it to Matt Mornick when when he and I were con conversing about the budget issue, and I thought, um, you know, maybe even just a special meeting on Wednesday, the day after, might be less um, distracting and disruptive for people. Yeah. Most often, the city council doesn't want to be meeting, uh, particularly very late on election night. So I'm happy yeah. to have uh, our city clerk explore with you some alternate dates. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks. Well, okay, Councilmember Reynolds, you're on mute again, Craig. If that's space bar. Sorry about that. I, I just wanted to thank Councilmember Andrew for bringing that up. That's one of the biggest nights of the year for me. I would certainly prefer to not have the meeting that night at any time since we'll be a party, I hope. Do you want to just do a quick thumbs up? I mean, is that possible? To, I mean, you could. The city clerk and city manager, you guys can schedule another uh, meeting date, but I think yeah. my druthers would be to uh, not meet on election night. Sure. So um, our preference from the staff would be to have another uh, a meeting that week, not to push it a week just because of sequencing. Uh, so I'll have Deb reach out and check uh, available dates with you for that week. Okay. I see a bunch of people's hands up, and I don't know if you were just giving a thumbs up on Thumbs that. up. That was a thumbs up. Okay, very good. Okay. So uh, we're moving now to council. Yes. Just just real quick. If doing it the week before would be an option we could explore, I'd, I'd appreciate that as, as well. It, it's actually, I apologize, it's not. We're, we've got everything sequenced in terms of how we can turn budget materials. So I, I need to either go Monday or Wednesday of election week if, if we can make that work. Okay, Monday would be my preference. Sure. But, right. uh, Deb, Deb will follow up with all of you, so I don't need calendars right now. Okay. Great. Th Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Great. Thank you for that. We're going to move to council member reports, but uh, first I want to congratulate, uh, we all should, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Wendy Weicker on receiving her Certificate of Municipal Leadership through the Association of Washington Cities. So congratulations. Okay. Now, um, now we're going to go to other council members for the reports. Uh, council member Anderall. Um, You know, we, the, the Sam and the utility board has not met that I'm liaison to the city board, uh, the utility board, and, and they have not met. Um, I, I expect there will be some business that will have to be done virtually down the road, but, um, and there is of course the, the annual rate adjustment. So, um, we're talking about that via phone but uh, nothing specific to report on that. And then the other uh, board that I'm on is the um, Washington Resource Area uh, 8, the Salmon Recovery Council, and we continue to have monthly or semi-bi-monthly uh, meetings uh, 
um, remotely. I think in every meeting, the facilitator has reported that they've never had such great attendance on these meetings. <laughs> So, um, so that's great. We got a lot. We got like 40, 50, 60 people. Um, and uh, it's been, yeah, it's, it's been very educational for me. And, and I'm happy to represent the city. Week about their plans uh, in advance of the town hall they do with the community, um, talking about what the school will look like in the fall. Um, obviously, we're uh, looking for ways we can support each other in sort of obviously these very unprecedented uh, times we're in. <clears throat> Thank you, yeah, it's definitely difficult times for parents with uh, school age kids. Uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker. Nope, nothing. Council Member uh, Jacobson. Uh, I think this, either Thursday or Friday, I think it's Friday, there's a, uh, a transportation meeting. And these things, have, the Eastside Transportation Association has merged its meetings with King County and a bunch of other things. So the, there's a mega meeting, I think sometime on Friday in our report back in September if there's I'll, I'll send an email if there's anything cool or hot or something on it. Great. Uh, so uh, this week I got a couple reports of uh, inbound to rent them commercial aircraft overflying the west side of Mercer Island. And they were complaining about the noise. And, I, you know, I think it's important for people to understand that we have a voice uh, with the Renton Airport. We have a seat on the Renton Airport Advisory Commission. Uh, I hold that seat. We've been working with the Renton Airport on their departure um, sequencing and their departure flights over the East Channel on what is known as the RMP procedures, uh, which are currently flown by Boeing. Uh, what happened this week were two return 737 flights. And so it's important for residents to understand that just because they're painted with their associated commercial airlines livery doesn't mean they're being operated by those commercial airlines. So an American tail painted uh, Boeing 737, not necessarily a, a commercial 737 American flight into Boeing Field or into Renton Field. So it's very rare, but we did have two return flights this week from Boeing. So every plane that is built there has its first flight out. And when there is a squawk that's important enough uh, and they wanna address it back at the, the Renton facility, they will turn around and they will reland. Uh, having two on one day was pretty rare and that occurrence is probably in five or less uh, per year anyway. So I just wanted people to know that uh, we're aware of that, we're working with Renton on that, uh, but those things are somewhat unavoidable in terms of having that production facility on the south end of the lake. Great, thank you. I have uh, three quick things. One of them is a public apology. Uh, three residents called and left voice messages on my voicemail on July 30. And um, unfortunately, all those voicemails were uh, erased. And so I, if you called me and left me a voice message on July 30, please call me back. We've changed the system, so that's not gonna happen again. Um, on July 31, I did attend a meeting um, to learn more about the Seattle East King County Foundation. I uh, attended the meeting with a number of other East King County mayors. Uh, it's a program that's being run through the Seattle Foundation and basically the focus is to um, allow Eastside residents or others basically to make uh, donations to organizations that are on East King County, uh, including Mercer Island. Um, and the focus is to uh, raise money in order to provide grants uh, to help mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Uh, they're gonna try to raise a million dollars in 2020 and are planning to deploy grants uh, this year. Uh, I provide that information to Sarah Palupas as well. Uh, lastly, on July 29, the King County Solid Waste Division sent a letter out to the Sound Cities Association uh, regarding uh, regional utility fees and rates and due in part to SCA's position, uh, the uh, Solid Waste uh, Division uh, decided not to increase rates in 2020, which is good news. Uh, unfortunately, of course, they are indicating, I'm sorry, they're not going to raise rates in 2021, but they've indicated that they may very well have to raise rates in 2022. So that's all I have. And um, again, there's no meeting on August 18th. And uh, I guess I would like to ask the city council members to stay seated um, as they, uh, they sign off. But I also need to um, state that uh, 
We will be going into executive session uh, shortly uh, after this meeting. Council will recess briefly and then go into executive session using teleconferencing technology provided by Microsoft Teams for approximately 60 minutes to discuss legal counsel um, uh, potential litigation. Uh, no further action will be taken. Uh, and with that, uh, good evening and stay safe and healthy.